That's all I wanted to speak with y'all about. Thank you. Thank you.
say the pledge this morning, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. Uh, good morning. Both sides ready to get started? The um, state ready? My notes indicate uh, after the excusal of the juror yesterday, number 94 will be now on the primary jury. Is that consistent with y'all's records? Yes, Judge. All right, 25 hours each side. Uh, we're going to start off first. Uh, do y'all intend to both argue? Yes, Judge. That'll be fine. Um, all right, I ask the jury to join us. Yesterday, as you know, one of the jurors was dismissed. Um, so now, not, juror number 94 will be on the uh, primary jury, the first 12. Yesterday, the evidence was closed. Uh, and now you will hear the closing statements of the attorneys, which is their uh, opportunity to come back before you, review the evidence with you, and try to sway your minds to one side or the other of the case, OK? Um, under our law, the state has the right to make some opening remarks to the closing, uh, be seated, and then let the defense argue fully, or they can waive that opening remarks. Do you desire to waive or argue something to begin with? No, Mr. they will waive. All right. So at this time, ladies and gentlemen, you'll hear the closing arguments of the defense first. Who's up first? Mr. Merchant? Yes, Your Honor. All right. You may make your closing to the jury. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you so much for your service over the last three weeks. We know what an imposition this has been for you. Um, it's been incredibly hard in your personal lives, I'm sure, and we appreciate uh, your time and attention for taking such good notes. Bo Dukes should be sitting in that chair, not Ryan. Um, Bo Dukes should be on trial for the murder of Tara Grinstead, not Ryan. Where was Bo Dukes in this trial? Why did the state not bring him? Why did we have to call Bo Dukes? Why did Bo Dukes not answer our questions? Be thinking about this as we talk about this case, uh, because there's, there's an important theme here. Ryan took the stand and sat in that chair and told you what he knew. He told you what happened. He didn't have to do that. He could have, he could have remained silent and sat over there this entire trial uh, and not told you his story. He, he, and you saw him sit there and tell you that story from his own mouth, with his own words, with his own emotion. And you saw how it affected him when he talked. Don't forget that when the state gets up here and tries to tell you that he's a liar. You saw him. You can tell whether he's telling the truth from that chair or not. Keep that in mind as we go through the evidence in the case because I think it's very important when we talk about his statement that he gave to the police, which you all have heard a lot about. There are a whole bunch of inconsistencies in that thing. And what did the witness yesterday, Mr. Posey, tell us? It was all over the place. Why was it all over the place? because he wasn't there. He has no idea what the facts are surrounding her death because he was not there. He told you who was there. Bo Dukes woke him up and said, I killed Tara. Not, I killed Miss Grinstead. I killed Tara. Bo Dukes had her as, uh, Bo Dukes was one of her students. Brian was not. Bo Dukes left that, that trailer that night with Ben McMahon in a black truck at around 10 o'clock at night. Ryan was passed out on the floor. You heard from, you heard from Jerry, famous Jerry now, I, I, I assume, uh, picked him up by the belt and dropped him on the floor to make sure he was alive. 
and he groaned, and that's, how, that's the last time anybody saw Ryan that night, passed out on the bathroom floor. Well, what does that mean? From a timing standpoint, it means a lot, because it means Bo, Bo Dukes was not in that trailer on Saturday night, Ryan was, and Tara Grinstead, as we'll see, left her house that night, and where did she go? These are all questions that the state could have answered for you, and they didn't. So you, don't, you never leave your, your common sense at the courthouse steps. As a juror, you're always entitled to use your human experience in your own daily life to understand what makes sense to you as a human being. You can listen to the evidence and the testimony all you want, but, but you, you all have your personal experiences that you draw from. As we go through this evidence, just use your common sense. What is the most likely thing that happened based on what we know about the evidence? Before I get through that part of it and start talking about the specific evidence uh, in the case, which in our view is very limited, I want to talk to you about what the state did in the presentation of its case and why it's important. There are, there are close to 300 exhibits in this case, photographs, uh, other kinds of documents. There, there were 35 witnesses they brought to you. As you're going through all that, and I'm sure the state's going to stand up and talk about the volume of evidence in this case. It's not about the volume of evidence. It's about the quality of the evidence. And you heard um, a GBI agent, Gary Rothwell, tell you uh, the larger the file, the less you know. That's exactly what's happening here. They're not going to tell you that, but they hid Bo Dukes. They hid her, her uh, best friend. They hid other stuff in, in this mass of evidence that they're going to say is all relevant. If you focus in on the details, which we heard yesterday, the details matter in terms of inconsistencies and in evidence, you're going to find there's very little here. And there's nothing that links Ryan to this murder at all. Nothing. Uh, and so you need to, as a juror, hold the state accountable for trying to hide information uh, and evidence from you in this volume of stuff. Don't make the same mistake that GBI made in 2005 by chasing all these leads. Uh, that had nothing to do with the case. They missed stuff that was obvious in 2005, and they missed stuff that was obvious in 2017 because they made an assumption after nearly 12 years of searching for Tara Winstead that they had their man. As soon as Ryan, Ryan Duke walked into that interview room, they had an answer, and they were going to close this case. They were anxious for closure of this case, and they were blinded by it and they refused to look at the details. Agent Shadell told you that when Ryan uh, gave the statement, that's it. There, he didn't go and look into the case file to see if it was actually consistent with the case evidence, and then we're gonna get into that in a second. He, he accepted everything, <coughs> even though there, there were unresolved inconsistencies in Ryan's statement, which we heard about yesterday from Agent Posey, that they can't explain. Again, the reason why the statement um, is so important to the state is there's no physical evidence linking Ryan to the crime, to the alleged crime scene. And the information that Ryan gave in the interview was fed to him by Agent Shadet. So if we look at the case evidence, and, and, we, and we do that with an assumption that the house is not the crime scene, the state wants you to assume that. If we don't assume it, and we look at what's actually inside the house, and, what, and, we, look at it, and we look at the car, and we look at the timeline, it doesn't add up. And that's reasonable doubt. So we know that Bo Dukes and Ben McMahon left the trailer at 10 o'clock on Saturday night. What, what do we know about Tara Grinstead? We know that she uh, went to the pageant, she had her cell phone with her uh, all day, and that she, uh, after the pageant, went to see um, a friend um, and then went to a cookout at Troy Davis's house and, and made several calls um, while she was there. She, lit, she leaves uh, Troy Davis' house around 11 o'clock to go, to go home. She says she's going home. After that, we have no idea what she did or who she saw. So we've heard several witnesses, GBI witnesses, come, and even folks who went into the house Monday morning come and tell you that they recognized uh, that there was no sign of a struggle inside the house. Now, uh, there was some talk about a lampshade, um, a candle tipped over on its side, uh, and, a, and a clock that was sitting upright on the floor. Those were the three things that, plus, plus there was a, a stain on the comforter, blood stain on the comforter. That's it. There's nothing else. 
If you, if, and if you look back, go back and review the testimony and the notes uh, from Agent Rossler, who's the crime scene uh, tech who, who processed the scene, he found no fingerprints anywhere inside the house. He found no fingerprints on the, on the, uh, from the door jam linking Ryan to the house. He found nothing in terms of fingerprints linking Ryan to the car or any, any other uh, back door, any of that sort of thing. Uh, nothing linking him fingerprint-wise to inside the house. But why is that important? Well, if you believe Ryan's statement to the G GBI in February of 2017, he said he didn't wear gloves when he went in initially. So that means he grabbed the doorknob and shut it. So he grabbed both doorknobs and shut it and didn't leave a fingerprint. How, that doesn't make common sense. Um, if, if, he had, if he had not used gloves, his fingerprints would be on the door. Uh, they'd be on the door casing. Um, so use your common sense. There, it, I think uh, Agent, Agent uh, Rothwell told us that they put a light bulb back in the lamp and it worked. So there was nothing unusual about the lamp itself. Uh, and of course, the house had been full of girls getting ready for a pageant. It, you can see from the pictures, and you will see from the pictures, and some that you've already seen, there, there, were, there were clothes everywhere, um, all this sort of stuff. I mean, it looked, looked consistent with uh, uh, girls being re getting ready for a pageant. The drawers. There was talk of this drawer. The state suggested that these drawers were opened as if somebody had gone inside there looking for stuff to steal. Well, That's, that's, the, that's the drawer that's open on the top. Here's your common sense. Doesn't that look like it just hasn't been pushed shut because the, clo the, the clothes are in the drawer? This is Exhibit 30. This, this is the other one they say the drawer was open as if to show it was evidence of some sort of theft. Use your common sense. It's a clothing drawer, and it's, it's, it's halfway out. The girls are getting ready for a pageant. What is the most likely reason that drawer is open, based on your common sense? So the bed. Let's talk about the bed. Um, there was all this talk about the bed, the comforter being all in disarray, and that was somehow suggested that uh, Miss Grinstead had been sleeping that night. Uh, Saturday night when, when Ryan came in, supposedly. Well, let's look at that. So we haven't talked about this before. I don't, I don't know that we ever asked a single witness this question, but the one thing you see on that bed are throw pillows. Why are there throw pillows on a bed she was sleeping in? You need to ask yourself a common sense question, but wouldn't she have taken the throw pillows off the bed if she was in the bed sleeping? That's just a, one of those common sense things. If you look at the photographs and, and you don't assume that there's a crime scene here, it makes perfect sense to you. The, the comforter itself, um, we, we heard from Dina uh, that they had flipped that over before the people got there to photograph it. So the fact that the comforter itself is not made, so to speak, is a function of people being in there before law enforcement got there and they flipped it over. And to their credit, they didn't know they were in a crime scene or think they were in a crime scene. They were trying to figure out what happened to her. Um, to, to their credit, they, they were just trying to figure out what happened. Okay. So use your common, common sense on that. And, and the blood itself, there's no blood on the floor. Um, nobody testified about any blood on the floor. There's no evidence of any cleanup on the floor that anybody attempted to hide it. There's no, and there's no blood on the bed, other than what you can see on the comforter in this picture. Again, you have to use your common sense, right? It, if Ryan's statement to the GBI is true, that he, that he struck a fatal blow to Tara Grinstead with one, one punch, and the state wants to suggest that this, that this blood is the result of that, Use your common sense. If, if that blow was significant enough to cause her death and, she, and to cause her to believe, would that bed not be full of blood? Or would there not be blood on the floor? And would there not be evidence that somebody had tried to clean it up? Your, your common sense tells you that, that that stain on that comforter 
is either from uh, uh, a monthly cycle or from sex itself. That makes sense, doesn't it? Common, common sense. The state's theory in this case is that this was a murderer. If you look on top of that dresser, there's a whole host of different types of jewelry laid out on top of it in plain sight. If this was indeed a burglary, then why, why is the jewelry still there? Uh, if, if this was such a desperation uh, act, why, why is the jewelry sitting in plain sight? Why, why wouldn't he have taken it? it? The burglary theory does not make sense. And it doesn't make sense for very, another very important reason, is how did, how did Ryan supposedly get in the house? with a credit card. Uh, let's think about that for a second. Uh, Agent, Agent Posey yesterday didn't even know whether there was a second lock on the door. That's how familiar with the file he was. He didn't even know there was a lock on the inside. And then when I asked him about it, he said, I can't, can't really tell if that's a lock or not. I knew all he needed to know right then about his opinions because he wouldn't agree with me on something so simple as whether or not that was a lock. You also heard Miss Hart uh, talk about that upper lock and use a photograph. She used this one. She used, she used this one to suggest to you, by asking another a witness a question, I think I believe it was Agent Shadell, she, she used this photograph to suggest to you that that law was not operational. And she referred to, oh, you've, you've seen these things in public bathrooms, they're missing, right? And she pointed to this picture as evidence of that. And you can clearly see right here that the area where that second part of the lock would be on this door casing up here is missing. So why would she suggest to you in that photograph that this lock was not operational? Of the, of the more, close to 300, of the close to 300 exhibits that they, that they gave to you, she did not give you this one which was in the case file. We had to tender this exhibit. This is the evidence that the door had a, an operational second part. We had to show that to you. The state didn't. They, they chose not to. Why would they choose not to put that one photograph, all these scene photographs, why are they not showing you that one? They're scared of that lock. That's why. What does that lock mean? Very important detail. It's not, it's not uh, listed anywhere in the GBI file. Largest file in GBI history, and there's no record of anybody sum summarizing any testimony or any uh, scene investigation that documents that interior lock. That lock is important because we learned that Tara Grinstead's greatest fear was being attacked at night. She and Heath Dykes were in love. And that relationship, um, we didn't get into the relationship. That's none of our business, honestly. What was important, though, is that they had a relationship where he would know that. He would be close enough to her to know that she would have locked that door at night. Her best friend also came here and told you, that, and she, she's known Tara, Tara Vincent since she was four years old. She saw her regularly, been inside that house regularly. And what did she tell you? She told you Tara would have locked that door if she'd been there that night. We know on Monday morning, Joe Portier shows up with the spare key from next door. That door is locked from the outside. He turns the key and opens it. That tells us that interior lock was never locked that night. That means Tara Grinstead was never inside that house, and that was not a crime scene. She left that house and locked the door behind her, took her purse and keys, and we don't know where she went, but we know she wasn't there. That interior lock is an important key fact in this case, and the GBI never found it. We had to find it and show it to you. And then, and then when we brought it up, the state didn't want to show it to you either. They wanted to hide it. That interior lock is important for another reason, too. It can't be picked. Gary Rothwell told you that. 
You can't use a credit card to pick that lock. It's a hotel style lock. It goes over like this and it locks and it, from the inside and you couldn't use a credit card to get in. So even, even if you assume that Ryan, Ryan's story about this credit card is true, it doesn't match up. Because if Tara's home inside, that door, that door lock is locked. And he's gonna, he, he can get the bottom lock picked maybe, but he's not gonna get that top one picked. That, that lock is critical to, to, to unlocking everything. So, and why is the front door so important? Uh, we, we saw pictures and you heard testimony that the back door was covered with decorations on the outside and she had a bunch of things stored next to it on the inside in the laundry room. So she didn't use that door and it was secure. All the windows in the house were secure. So if the state's theory is correct, whoever went inside that house to do this crime in this alleged crime scene had to go through the front door. Why are there no, why are there no fingerprints for, for Ryan on, on the door handle? Why are there no fingerprints or anything else inside the house from Ryan? Why is Ryan's DNA not in the house? So the other thing about the doors, which is important, I, I asked a few questions of witnesses about this, is the chimes. Aside, aside from, aside from uh, her habit, uh, based on her fear of being attacked, she had door chimes on both doors. Well, the purpose of which is to make sure she knew when someone opened the door. Now, it's less important for us necessarily to, to think about how that might have affected her if she heard him ring that night, assuming someone had gone in. But more importantly, if she was scared enough to have chimes on both doors to alert her to people coming into the house, she would have locked that door from the inside if she'd been home. We also heard from her best friend that she had a pair of yoga pants that were missing. And there was some, at least one witness told us uh, that uh, there was the pair, she had told the GBI, uh, I guess Gary Rothwell told us this, that, that she had, they were familiar with the case and that she had uh, also uh, a pair of sneakers from this, a lace up pair of sneakers. Uh, where are the yoga pants? Where did they go? Um, this is, this is also other evidence suggesting that, that uh, Tara Grinstead changed when she went home and then left again around 11 o'clock or 11.15. I suspect the state's gonna come up here and talk about the cell phone. This is gonna be like the smoking gun of, of, of why uh, Tara had to be in the house because of her habit with the cell phone. So the cell, there were, I believe there may have been one witness or two who talked about her always keeping her cell phone on her. Uh, and we all understand that, we, we do that too. But, but sometimes they, they lose the charge. It was found on the charger and she had had it all day long. Is it reasonable to believe that it was sitting on the charger because she had just put it on there to charge after she had just gotten home? There's nothing unusual about that. There's nothing unusual about that that suggests that it is, this is somehow evidence uh, that she was taken from the home without her cell phone. It just means it might have been charging. I, I want to talk about Ms. Grinstead's car. Um, this, was, this was a white sports car that apparently everybody recognized in town. It was, uh, it was an unusual car, uh, to say the least, at that time. And so everybody sort of recognized it. Um, where was the car? John Olmsted said he took his dog out around midnight for a walk, and that car was gone. Where did it go? And why is that important? It's further proof that Tara Grinstead left her residence that night in that car. The earliest anybody can testify uh, that they saw it again on Sunday are the Boykins. They said it was between two and four o'clock. So that car is unaccounted for from midnight to about two o'clock the next day. Where was it? It just suddenly appears again and it appears unlocked. Joe Portier, who knows Tara's habits with the car, said she never left it unlocked. Maria said she never left it unlocked. Both of them agreed that if it was unlocked, that that would be really unusual. It was unlocked 
when it was found on New Morning. Nobody unlocked it. And they, they talked about that with the GBI when they were interviewed initially uh, in October. The, the, car, the car is missing between midnight and 2 p.m. at the earliest. We have other witnesses who say that the car wasn't there until 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock at night. Um, uh, we're not going to quibble over the two, two to four hours that we're talking about there. The car's definitely missing. Nobody sees the car for a very significant period of time. Where was the car? And where was Bo during all of this? We would have loved to have asked him that. We wanted to. We called him. We were going to ask him a whole line of questions about where he was and what he was doing. But we didn't get that chance. So another thing I want to talk about is this, um, the, the portion of Ryan's statement where he says, uh, I went back to get her and let's talk about the phone, the phone stuff. So under the, the theory Agent Shadell has is that he went back, he had, he had some guilty knowledge about making a call. But well, Ryan told you why he made the call. Bo had just said he killed her. And he was trying to figure out whether he was lying or not. And he was trying to get her purse back to her. So he made the phone call to see where she was, if she was okay, and to um, return her purse. So this all this guilty knowledge stuff just shows that he was concerned for Miss Grinstead and was trying to find out if Bo was, this was another Bo crazy story or whether Bo had actually done something to her. Uh, under the state's theory, Brian drove back to that house in broad daylight on Sunday at church time, took a, took a quilt, put Miss Grinstead in the quilt, carried her out the front door, put her in the truck, then went back to lock the front door. Because we know the door was locked, right? So he had to go back after doing this and risk being seen at 9.30 in the morning to lock the front door. Does that make common sense? It doesn't make common sense. Why would he do that? What's the reason to lock the front door? Wouldn't he just get in the truck and go if he's trying to avoid detection? It doesn't make common sense. The other issue with that, while we're talking about this, is if he had dropped a glove during this process, which is the, the state's theory, that somehow he dropped this glove while carrying Miss Finstead's body out of her house, when he went back to lock the door, would he not have seen it? It was in plain sight. How, how would he have missed it? And he would, have, he would have missed it twice. He would have missed it when he walked to the front door, and then he would have missed it again when he walked back. And, he, and the state's theory is he was trying to avoid being detected and avoid, avoid looking like he was carrying the body out. So he missed it twice if it's sitting on the ground when the state says it's sitting on the ground. So let's talk more about the glove. This is the state's smoking gun, right, the glove. But what do, we, what do we know about that glove? We know the state has about a single witness to tell you that it was on the ground before Monday morning. Not one. They don't have a single person that came in here and told you that that glove was on the ground before Monday morning. We brought you some folks to tell you that on Sunday they didn't see it. Jared Luke walked to her front door Sunday evening to get a, a, a water bowl for the, for the dog and to get the food. He said he walked up to the front door, he parked in the driveway and then he walked up to the front door in a diagonal across the yard is what he said. He missed it. If it's on the ground at 9.30 in the morning on Sunday and he goes there at six o'clock to deal with his dog, dog's uh, things, and he walks directly to the front door and then back, he's missed it twice. And he said that was during daylight hours. So, he, so two people now have missed this glove twice in broad daylight. That does not make common sense. So he dikes um, when he doesn't hear from uh, Ms. Grinstead, starts to get very concerned. And you saw the, the phone calls and all of that. He's a captain in the police department. He lives an hour and 20 minutes away. He drives, he's so concerned, he drives all the way uh, to Osceola to check on her. When he gets here, he's in, I, I, I would, 
be fair to classify it as panic mode, because it's not like her to not call him back. He's trained in scene investigations. And what did he tell you he saw at midnight on Sunday? He did not see a glove. He was looking for things that might be out of the ordinary to figure out what was going on. He's searching the outside of the house. He's looking in windows. He's walking around. He went walked around to the carport. He's, he's, he sat here and he told you, he said, I didn't see a glove, and I would have seen a glove if it was there. That was his testimony. What's the only conclusion you could draw from that? That glove was not on the ground. It was not on the ground at midnight uh, into, Sunday, into Monday morning. How does, that, how does that line up with the state's theory of the case? They haven't brought you a single person that's going to dispute that. All they're going to say is that glove was on the ground Monday morning. What does that tell us? And it's in plain sight. Let, let's, let's call a spade a spade here. You couldn't miss that glove. You've seen the photographs of it. You're going to have a chance to look at it when you guys go back to the jury room. Look, it's within two feet of the, of the stones uh, that go up to her front porch, and it's like within five feet of the front porch itself. Everybody saw it. Wouldn't Heath Dykes, even if it's dark, be able to see that white, whitish colored glove right off the stone pathway? Use your common sense. There's only one explanation for that glove. And, and we, have, we have got testimony from uh, the GBI agent Ashley Hinkle about that. Um, if you may remember, um, uh, Mr. Gibbs asked her a couple questions uh, about process. And that process involved trying to get Bo Duke's uh, DNA off that glove. They tried and tried and tried to exclude him as a contributor to that glove, and they couldn't do it. They excluded dozens of other folks. They, they, they tested everybody, and they were all excluded. They could not exclude Bo Dukes from the glove. And she also told you that, that the DNA on the glove would be consistent with someone dropping it in the front yard. Now, the state's probably going to argue, how could Bo Dukes in a million years know that there was DNA on that glove? He might not have, but he knew, it, he knew it, was, it could be Ryan's and that people would investigate. That's the important part of the DNA issue with the glove, because they can't get bow off it. And a, a final piece on the glove, uh, Gary Rothwell told you they considered that it, it had been planted. And I'm telling you, that, that's what our theory is, is that Bo did, did, Bo did this on purpose uh, sometime between midnight and in the early morning hours of Monday. Um, I don't, no one will know for sure because we couldn't ask him the questions. We really wanted to, but, but he, he was not made available to us. Uh, why, why he did it at that time, we don't know. Uh, whether he had help, we don't know. Uh, we're not going to cast aspersions or blame anybody uh, without knowing exactly what happened. But we know, we, we can surmise that he did have some help because the car comes back. Somebody had to, had to get him and somebody had to drive the car. So what happened? Um, what happened that Saturday night into Sunday morning? So bear with me, Rod. I, I, I took some time last night. I'm, I'm about ready to turn this over to my better half, uh, who's smarter than me. She's going to talk to you about how the law applies to this case. Um, but I'm, I'm going to read. I'm going to read a, a, some questions that I wrote, um, so so that I can uh, try to explain to you the doubts you may have and what impact that will have as you deliberate on this case. You have an awesome responsibility, a, 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 an incredibly difficult responsibility, and that's trying to determine uh, if Mr. Ryan Duke over there is guilty uh, of this murder. And that's an incredible responsibility. So as you consider that question, consider these as well. After seeing Ryan testify, does some part of you think the state arrested the wrong person? If so, that doubt would be reasonable. Do you have a doubt in your mind about whether the, state, the state's theory of this case is correct or makes common sense? If you had a doubt about that, it's reasonable. Do you have a doubt in your mind why uh, Ms. Grinstead's favorite uh, pair of sweatpants were missing from the house? If you do, that doubt's reasonable. Do you have a doubt in your mind why her upper door lock was not locked from the inside? If you do, that doubt is reasonable. Do you have a doubt why all law enforcement agree that there was no evidence of a crime being committed in her house? If you do, that doubt is reasonable. Do you have a doubt in your mind whether Ms. Grinstead was in her house when she was killed? 
Uh, th that doubt would be reasonable. Do you have a doubt about whether her car was gone when John Olmsted was out walking his dog around 11.30 or midnight on Saturday night? If you do, that doubt would be reasonable. Do you have a doubt in your mind about whether Ryan was able to get into her house with a credit card without being seen if that lock had been locked up there? If so, that doubt would be reasonable. Do you have a doubt in your mind as to whether a tilted lampshade, a candle, and a clock on the floor constitute evidence of any crime? If so, that doubt would be reasonable. Do you have a doubt as to how Ryan could have gotten into her house without leaving any finger fingerprints or DNA? If so, that doubt would be reasonable. And do you have a doubt in your mind as to whether it's reasonable to argue that the blood on the comforter is from a blow to the head, a fatal blow to the head? If so, that doubt would be reasonable. Do you have a doubt in your mind about whether or not such a blow could uh, happen without any blood loss? If so, that doubt would be reasonable. Do you have a doubt as to why Ryan would go back and lock the front door after carrying uh, Ms. Grinstead's body out under the state's theory? If so, that doubt would be reasonable. I could go on and on and on about this. There's just so many, so many specific factual questions you can ask yourself um, based on your common sense experience as jurors and say, does that make common sense to me? Or do I have a doubt about it? If you have a doubt about that, it goes directly to the state's theory of the case. And that doubt would be reasonable. They brought you 35 witnesses and over 300 exhibits. I challenge you, when you go back there, to look at it and see how much of it actually helps answer the question, what happened to Tara Grinstead on Saturday night. They had a statement from Ryan, and they have a glove. We've talked about the glove. We've talked about the statement. I could get up here and talk to you all day long about some of the stuff that Agent Posey and I were going over yesterday. Uh, you've recently heard that testimony, so I'm not going to do it. But I will remind you uh, that you got to hear from Ryan directly, not through us, not through any other uh, means, but you got, to, you got to see him testify from the chair and see him get emotional about this. And he took responsibility for what he did. That's an incredible thing for him to do as a criminal defendant because most don't do that. All right, so I am going to turn the, the stage over to uh, my better half, uh, who's going to talk to you about uh, uh, the instructions you'll receive from the court. I want to thank you all so much for your time. This is the last chance I'll get to talk to you on behalf of Ryan. Greatly appreciate your time and attention. Um, thank you. I will probably be a little more brief um, because I'm going to be talking to you about the law and how that applies to the facts in this case or the lack of facts in this case, lack of evidence in this case. One of the concepts that the judge is going to charge you on, and you're going to get copies of these charges. So they're, they're charges of the law, and what that is, is that is the judge telling you what the law is that you have to apply in this case to the facts as you've heard them. Um, one of those is what reasonable doubt is. The judge is going to tell you that the state has the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Ryan committed this crime in the manner that they have charged in this indictment. He's also going to tell you that the state has the burden to disprove our defense in this case. So not only do they have the burden to prove what they say happened, they also have to disprove what we said happened. And that's very important. Um, Rebuttal, you, you've seen how a trial works, you've seen the state put up their case, the defense put up their case, and then the state rebuttal. That's what rebuttal's for. It's for them to attempt to disprove what we put up. And I challenge you that they did not disprove anything that we submitted in our case. Ryan told you what happened, and the state did not bring one single bit of evidence to disprove what Ryan told you under oath on that stand. Reasonable doubt can also be conflicts in the evidence, and the charges are going to tell you that. It's, it's conflicts in the evidence. And so you all have to determine what conflicts you found in the evidence, and we'll talk about some of those, and determine if there's reasonable doubt to resolve those conflicts. Reasonable doubt can also be found in lack of evidence. So if there's something that is missing for you, that is reasonable doubt. It's also any combination of these. And when the judge charges you, he's going to give you this specific language that if your mind at the end of this case is wavering, unsettled, or unsatisfied, it is your duty to acquit. It is your duty to check not guilty on that verdict form. Wavering, 
unsettled or unsatisfied. Those are important terms, those are legal terms. But they also are common sense terms, you know what that means. And if your mind has any of those today, it is your duty as a juror to find Ryan not guilty. The jury charges talk about corroboration, okay? This is a legal term, so I wanna kinda talk about it, but it's a common sense term too. I mean, everybody knows what corroboration means. The charge that you're gonna hear is that an out-of-court statement, so Ryan's statement to Agent Shadell is an out-of-court statement. If that out-of-court statement is not supported by any other evidence, it is not sufficient to justify a conviction. Even if you believe the unsupported statement. Why is that important? If you believe that what Ryan told Agent Shadell, if you believe that, that's not enough. They have to present evidence to every element of this crime to corroborate that statement. They have to bring you evidence. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the cause of death. They have to prove how Mr. Grinstead died. Outside of his statement, they have to prove where Ms. Grinstead died. They have to prove she died in Irwin County. And they have to prove that she died from a single blow, a punch, a hit from Ryan. When you listen, and I, I'm sure when the state gets up there, they're going to play Ryan's statement. I would imagine that that's what they're going to play. And they may play just excerpts of it. I doubt they'll play the entire thing for you. I'm sure they will play excerpts. I want you to remember that they are picking and choosing what you hear out of that statement. They're picking and choosing what they believe is true out of that statement. They're not playing for you what Ryan told you here in court under oath. They're not playing for you what he told you when he could testify truthfully and honestly without fear of Bo Dukes. He told you why was he not able to tell this before? Because he was scared. And we asked every single one of you in jury selection if you believed that a person would lie to protect their family. And everybody agreed. We asked the agents that. We asked both agents who talked to you about interviews if they were trained that people would lie to protect their family, and they both told you yes. Agent Chevelle told you yes, and Agent Posey told you yes. That is in their training. Ryan told you that he lied to protect his family from a person that walked in this courtroom in shackles and wouldn't even admit what his name was. So finally, why can Ryan come in and tell you the truth? Bo is in prison. Ryan told you that. Bo is finally in prison. Ryan can finally, and you saw it. You saw what he's been holding in all these years. He's been keeping Bo's secret for almost two decades. You, you saw that on his face. And so the state's going to play what they want you to believe, a statement that was given when Bo was on the loose, a statement that was given when Ryan was scared, when Ryan had taken drugs, when Ryan had been suffering from anxiety, depression, all of these issues for all these years, they're gonna pick and choose. What is that? Smoke and mirrors. That is trying to divert you from what you heard on this witness stand. One of the other things, sorry. <laughs> one of the other things, and it's not exciting, but one of the other things that the state has to prove is what's called venue, okay? Another term, but common sense. He's going to read you the charges. Venue is in the county where the state proved, beyond a reasonable doubt, the cause of death was inflicted. If the cause of death can't be determined, venue is where the state proved the dead body is discovered. We asked every witness that was qualified to answer this, what the cause of death was. There is no testimony as to what the cause of death is in this case. Not one single bit of evidence. Not one statement. The experts that they brought said, we cannot determine the cause of death. And again, it's not a, it's not a fun topic to talk about, but the law requires that the cause of death be committed in Irwin County, and it requires that they prove the cause of death. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason that the law requires that. We do not want to send innocent people to prison. 
talk a little bit about some of the specific charges. Um, the, the state charged in the first three counts of the indictment, and you'll get a copy of the indictment. Um, they charged malice murder is the first count. What do they have to prove? They have to prove malice, and I'm sure the state's going to talk to you a lot about malice, but malice in this case isn't really, I'm not going to spend any time talking about it because it's just not relevant. It doesn't, it, there was no evidence of malice. Um, but what else do they have to prove? They have to prove that Ryan caused her death in the manner that they said he did, by using his hand. They have to prove that. For felony murder, the second two counts, two and three, they also have to prove that he caused Ms. Grinstead's death. They have to prove that he caused her death while burglarizing her home and while he was assaulting her with his hand. They have to prove that she died in that manner. That is cause of death. Um, for, for those counts, the first three, the murder counts, and I'm lumping them together again, the malice murder and the felonies, um, beyond a reasonable doubt, they have to prove the cause of death. They have to prove Irwin County, and they have to prove by the hand. And I'm going to talk about some elements that you can, you can consider because I believe the state will argue to you that a hand can be considered a deadly weapon. Okay, well, well what does the law say about that? The law says, and you're going, to read, you're going to hear these, the judge is going to read them to you, the factors to be considered. The nature and the extent of any injury inflicted. We heard no testimony about any injury inflicted. The character or capabilities of the weapon. Is it possible to die from a single hit with a hand? Um, and we're not even getting there because Ryan did not hit Ms. Grinstead. But looking at the state's case, that's what they're going to argue. Um, the manner that the hand was used. Any other circumstances of the case. The other counts are the aggravated assault and the burglary. Um, I talked about the aggravated assault enough. It, it's whether or not he committed a crime and, and committed serious, but rendered serious bodily injury. So there'd have to be some testimony that Ms. Grinstead suffered a serious bodily injury in Irwin County, in her home, by Ryan. Um, the burglary, same thing, Irwin County, in her home, that he um, broke into her house with the intent to commit a theft. And John talked to y'all about the locks. Y'all have this picture back there. It's pretty clear. <laughs> you can see it right there. Um, you'll have it back there, so, so feel free to take it with you and look at it. The last count is concealing the death. What are the elements of that crime? That Ryan concealed Ms. Grinstead's death, that he hindered the discovery of whether or not she was killed in Irwin County. We are not here to determine if he assisted in burning Ms. Grinstead in cremating her in Ben Hill County. We are here to determine whether or not he assisted in concealing her death in Irwin County. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I want to talk about the, um, the corroboration again when I'm talking about the charges I talked about corroboration I anticipate and I, and I have to say what I anticipate the state's going to argue because I don't get to come back up here after they argue um, this is the last you get to hear from us so we don't get to come and rebut what they say they get to rebut what we say but we don't get to rebut what they say and that's that's just the law so that's fine so I'm telling you what I anticipate trying to answer whatever questions they may raise for you that I'm anticipating they will um, I anticipate they're going to argue that this 411 call was guilty knowledge um, Ryan told you he called Ms. Grinstead's house that Saturday, uh, Sunday morning. He told you why. Um, he told you he was trying to return her purse. That phone call is not evidence that he killed Ms. Grinstead. It's not. Under any common sense, reasonable theory, that phone call is not corroboration that he killed Ms. Grinstead and she died in her home as the result of a hit in Irwin County. It's not. It doesn't corroborate that. Um, it's not guilty knowledge of anything. It's not corroboration for the crimes that he has charged. It's, it's again, it's, it's the smoke and mirrors. It's this illusion that there's evidence. It's this illusion that there's corroboration when there is none. Same thing with this glove. Um, I'm not going to belabor it. I know Mr. Merchant, John, <laughs> talked about this a lot. Um, the, we had three witnesses that were outside Ms. Grinstead's home on Sunday. Three. None of them saw the glove. The glove does not corroborate murder. The glove does not corroborate aggravated assault. 
The glove does not corroborate any charge in this indictment. There is no conflict in the evidence. So we talked about reasonable doubt and how you could consider conflicts in the evidence or lack of evidence. On this glove, there is zero conflict. You don't have to resolve it. It's clear. Every single witness that came in here and took the stand said the glove was not here on Sunday. There is no evidence that it was there on Sunday. No evidence that it did not appear until Monday morning. Any argument to the contrary is trying to get you to not look at the actual evidence in the case. Um, we, have, we had witnesses in our rebuttal, and we had some during direct, about good character. The judge is going to tell you that in Georgia, the good character of a defendant is a defense in a crime. There were witnesses that took this stand that said, Ryan is a peaceful, kind, and caring person. Not one single person testified to the contrary. Not one. The state has to disprove that good character, that peaceful character, beyond a reasonable doubt. They have not brought one single person to disprove Ryan's peaceful character. And you heard from members of your own community. You heard from, from great members of your community um, that Ryan is a peaceful and kind person. I want to, um, like, since I said I, I can't get back up here, I want to leave you with some questions. And so I'm going to get. Thank you. Again, since, since we don't get to come back up here, um, and, and the, we don't have a burden. The state has to answer. Thank you. The state has to answer every question in this case. Any question, any doubt you have, they have to answer. So I've written out in my terrible handwriting <laughs> some questions that I challenge the state to get up here and answer for you. Because you deserve to have an answer to these questions. How does the glove corroborate how Ms. Grinstead died? Cause of death. Something they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. How does the glove corroborate that Ryan caused her death? I asked Agent Chanel these questions, and he said it doesn't. He said there's no evidence of this. How does the glove corroborate that she died in Irwin County? A glove that did not appear until Monday morning. How does the call corroborate, this, this 411 call? How does it corroborate the cause of death? Remember, the law says his statement has to be corroborated. So they want you to believe that that one statement is the statement that is the holy grail. And they have to corroborate it. How does that call corroborate that Ryan is the one that killed Ms. Grinstead? How does it corroborate that she actually even died in Irwin County? What proof beyond a reasonable doubt has the state brought you to prove Ryan's statement to Agent Shadell was accurate? Because everything you heard from the witness stand was that it was not, that it was a mess. It was all over the place. What evidence has the state brought you to disprove Ryan's sworn testimony in front of you beyond a reasonable doubt? They have to do all this. They have to answer all these questions. And again, I don't get to get back up here. So I, I, I leave these questions and challenge the state to try and answer these questions because Everybody deserves, they're, they're asking you to convict a man of murder, and they can't answer these questions. And the law requires that. Um, some other questions that I couldn't fit on my board. Um, has one single person come in here to testify that they saw that glove on Sunday? No. Three said they didn't. So I challenged the state to tell you what evidence they have that that glove was there on Sunday other than they just want you to believe it. How is it possible, another question that I, I'd love the state to be able to answer, how is it possible that you heard from five witnesses, five witnesses that did not see Ms. Grinstead's car on Sunday morning, but not one single witness to come and say they saw Ryan carrying out a body in a quilt? Not one. In broad daylight, when everybody is headed to Sunday school. Not one. How is it possible that Ryan broke into Miss Grinstead's house with a credit card when she had a hotel style lock? And 
I challenge the state. Why did they not bring you this photo? Why did they ask witnesses about this photo that doesn't show this part? To create the illusion, to create smoke and mirrors, so that you believed that, oh, it might be broken. Have you never been in a public bathroom where it's broken? Those were the questions that were asked. Well, that's disingenuous. It's not broken. And you heard testimony that she installed that lock specifically because Anthony Vickers had tried to break into her house. That lock was there specifically to avoid people breaking in. She used that lock. How is it possible that Ryan, this is another question that I challenge the state to answer. How is it possible that Ryan killed Ms. Grinstead in her home with one hit and left no blood? And they brought in a crime scene expert to say there was no evidence of cleanup. They put that testimony in, no evidence of cleanup. So no evidence of cleanup and this comforter is what they got? What evidence does the state have as to what happened to Ms. Grinstead? What evidence outside of a statement, an uncorroborated statement that was given by a man who was scared for his life and by a man who was trying to protect his family under the influence of drugs, we can dispute that, but I, everybody can agree that he took some drugs. Whether he took one, whether he took two, who knows? But a man who was confused and didn't get the facts that Agent Chanel wanted him to say, right. So he kept asking and asking and asking. Ryan did something awful, and he admitted that to you on the stand. He has lived with that guilt for almost two decades. He did not kill Tara Grinstead. He did not break into her house. He did not assault her. He is not the cause of Ms. Grinstead's death. And he did nothing to contribute to her death. He's not guilty of every single count in this indictment. Um, we're here to ask you to seek the truth and seek justice for everyone in this case. And that would be a verdict of not guilty. I started this trial off talking about power. Ryan told you he, he felt powerless all those years. The state has had the power to bring you evidence, to bring you proof, and they have failed to do that. You now have the power to do the right thing. You know how, now have the power to say, that's not enough. You did not prove this case. Ryan did not do this. He did not kill Ms. Grinstead. We all know who killed Ms. Grinstead. Ryan told you who killed Ms. Grinstead. The person who killed Ms. Grinstead came in here and pled the fifth to his name. Ryan got up here and withstood cross-examination and let you, it, all of his stuff, I mean, just, you know, things about he was depressed, things that nobody should have to get up here and testify in, in the public to. But he told you that. And at the end of the day, you now have the power. You have the power to make the decision in this case. And we trust you and think that you will find Ryan not guilty. And that's how we ask that you submit your verdict on that form. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a uh, recess before we start the state summation. Anybody want to get some fresh air? Just follow the normal routine. Let's everybody remain in place while the jury steps out of the courtroom, please. Thank you. says about 10 minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. All right, y'all ready, Mr. Rigby? Yes, sir. Ask the jury to join us, please. Okay, Mr. Rigby, you can make your closing for the state. Ryan Duke, the man in that chair, confessed to the murder of Tara Vincent. He confessed with the words of his own mouth the words expressed from his own thoughts. He convicts himself by his own words. The man in that chair, Ryan Duke, confessed to you with his words. He confessed to you in his handwriting. He confessed to you with his actions. His actions as he walked. Through an orchard. In this chair. He confesses through his words through his writing, through his actions. He confesses to you through his DNA. He confesses to you with his palm prints that he is the murderer, the killer of Tara Grinstead, the monster he doesn't want to be. The monster he hides from everyone. He confesses to you. You've all heard it. 34 ears. You heard it. 34 eyes. You saw it. He confesses to you that he murdered Derek Greenstein. It is uh, Wednesday, February the 22nd, 2017, at approximately 12.52 a.m., located at the O'Sullivan Sport. Interview of Ryan Duke, pursuant to the current investigation. Um, and I, you didn't ask me yesterday, and I guess we can get around to it, but um, do you have any idea why I've actually come down here today? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm going to be taking notes and as we're dialogues back and forth. Don't think I'm ignoring you. Uh, remember, we are just audio recording it, so anything you say, if it's a yes or no. Yes sir, I understand. Okay. What makes you think it's about Terry? Uh, it's, I was involved with it, man. Okay. Uh, Tell me what happened. I used to break into people's houses just to steal money. I was a drug addict. Um, I've been drinking, I was high, I don't remember everything clearly. Okay. But uh, I was stealing from the purse and she snuck up on me and I hit her. I didn't mean to. You could really reactionary, but in my brain, I, I mean, I didn't know what else to do. Okay. And, uh, the dog race, I didn't come forward before. Okay. I mean, I just. I can't lie, I can't live with myself, I'm so sick of this stuff. I think there's other people who feel the same way you do too, don't you think? No, sir. Okay. I'm tired, and my family's good people, I didn't want to do this to them. Okay. 
let's take them. You want to set them to drink? Okay. I, I thought about that. It seemed like my horse has been loose by a three, and you know, I've been holding on to that three for so long. I'm going to fucking wrap that. You know, it's, it's but you're doing about that? No, sure I'm not. Right I, now, you will. If I'd been a man, I'd, I'd have done something. It doesn't matter when. Yes, That's right. It does. Fear is fear. But you're doing the right thing now. Don't feel like it. Well, I'm telling you. No. Having done this for a long time, this is the reason. I can see that effects. I, I could tell yesterday that this was bothering you. Uh, All right. Slow down. Let's back up a little. Okay. What night did you go to her house? Uh, that was that night. I can't remember. I was so strung out. I was working at a factory, working 70 something hours a week. And hey, it, it was in September, I think. Uh, later in the year, the fall, the exact year, I don't know, everything's just been upside down since then. Okay. Okay. You went to the house. How did you get into the house? Uh, it's easy. Uh, the bottom did bolt. You can pop the lock real easy. I mean, I've broken people. I've never still worn 20 bucks. I mean, I'm just not proud of it. You know, I, I know this is just what. I'm going to just pause for one second because what you're telling me is, is information I'm, and I, keep, I want you to keep talking to me. Just, but because of where we're going with this, I'm, I'm, I know that you've never been in a real major trouble before. I understand I'm going to prison. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is moving forward, I want to make you aware of your rights. I have to. I have to aware of Okay. Well, I'm going to read that for to you and let you do that. Okay. statement when he said, I'm overwhelmed with guilt because I murdered her. You, you, you know he's a liar. You know that. Did I hit her being this tonight? No, she died when I hit her. I lived. She died, and I left. She died, and I left. And he tells you how he did it. He says, I hit her. Now, Miss Birch and I disagree on what I have to prove. You will not hear the judge charge you in the way that she said that. The judge will charge you on the law. Miss Merchant is not the giver of the law. The court will give you the law. This defendant told you what he did. The state has the burden of proof in this case. It is beyond a reasonable doubt. The judge will charge you on beyond a reasonable doubt. That does not mean beyond all doubt. It's not what it means. The charge will tell you that. It does not mean to a mathematical certainty. You don't have to put a percentage on it. That's not what it means. It's not, as you've heard sometimes, beyond a shadow of any doubt. That's not what it means. 
It is the doubt of a fair-minded, impartial juror honestly seeking the truth. That's what we ask you to do. You all said you could be fair and impartial during jury selection. You could set aside all the media talk and conspiracy theories and listen to the evidence in the courtroom. That's what you said you could do. Took an oath to do. And seek the truth. You're truth seekers today. That's what the state asks you to do is seek truth. They, they want you to list questions and look for doubt. I, I want you to seek the truth. Be truth seekers. And the truth is exactly what came out of his mouth is he hit Tara Grinstead in her home and he left. We're going to talk some more about that. So they want to say the state's going to play excerpts of the statements. You won't have the statements back with you in the jury room, but you're, you're welcome to come back and listen to all of it. I can't play all of it because I don't have It's over two hours long. I only have two hours to give you a closing argument, and I'm not going to do that. You won't have it back with you, but you can come listen to all of it. But yes, I'm going to play you excerpts where he tells you he did it. And they want you to reward the man because he burned her body. That's what they want you to do. They want you to give him a prize and a reward because he took her body from her home out to an orchard and had his buddy, Bo, burn him with him. That's what they want. Who's, who's hiding stuff from you? He is. Burn trash over her. This is why you believe it. Trash. Trash, 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 trash. He told you on the witness stand what? I only went out there that one time. You know what he says in his statement? We went back out there again and we threw some household trash on her. The physical evidence doesn't lie, ladies and gentlemen. Trash. Household trash. He's got a lot to lose, so he's got a lot. Trash. They brought in an ex-girlfriend and another girl to say he was nice to women. He thought so much of Tara burned her like a common household trash. That's how he thought of women. Hiding stuff. You remember one of the, one of the young ladies, Miss Daniels, I believe is her name, from Tallahassee. How did she describe him in high school? He was carefree. Not burdened and depressed. He, he, I didn't see that side of him. statement, her family, Mr. Billy and Miss Connie and Anita have suffered long enough. But even five years later, he's still making them suffer. As he tortured and lost the soul of Tara Grinstead, he still tortures their souls that are present here today. The first count in the indictment is what's called malice murder. 
The judge will charge you on the offenses. What the state is required to prove, contrary to what Ms. Burchett told you, what the state is required to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt are the elements of the offense. That's what we're required to prove to you. The defendant admits in his statement that he murdered her, that he killed her, and he left. I struck her, I hit her with my hand. And you heard what, the, what even their great Dr. Talitsky, the psychologist, said, those were great questions. Just tell me what happened. And he tells him what happens. No tricks, no techniques. He just tells him what happens. We're going to talk more about Dr. Talitsky a little bit later. That he admits to malice murder. The judge will charge you that the state is not required, not required to prove premeditation. We don't have to prove that he planned to go over there and kill Tanner Grinston. Not required for malice murder. The judge will charge you that the state is not even required to prove motive to you. Not a requirement. So he tells you what his motive was. But we're, we're not even required to do that. He tells you his motive was, I'm a drug addict, and I need money to buy drugs, and I break in people's houses, and I steal $20. And I was going through her purse. Who brings up her purse? He does. I was going through her purse, and she surprised me. Who puts her in her house where she was killed? He does. Who puts venue in Irwin County where she was killed? He does. His own mouth. His own words. It's not me making something up. It's not me talking about a theory or maybe this was that or maybe this was there. No, he puts it in her house, in her purse, which is a burglary. We'll talk about burglary some more in a minute. Malice murder. No premeditation is required for us to prove. No motive is required for the state to prove, although you have his statement of what his motive was. The judge will charge you that malice can be either express or implied. And the judge will charge you that that can be determined from the circumstances surrounding the event. The same malice, I'm left-handed, with which you punch someone is enough. Malice is just that deliberate intent to do harm. When he struck her and hit her, he deliberately intended to harm her. And that the judge will charge you that that can be formed in an instant. When she surprises him and he turns around not to get caught in a burglary in her home, this single woman, he punches her with intent to harm. And then from the circumstances before, during, and after, you can, by his conduct and what he says, he goes and hides the body and burns it almost beyond recognition. And the judge will charge you about an abandoned and malignant heart. And if that's not what an abandoned and malignant heart is, You kill someone after you've broken in their home and you go and you burn their body so furiously and fiery that DNA can't even be extracted from her bones. He tells you he was dead in her house several times. That's the venue in Irwin County. And even if you believe the, the lies he told on the witness stand, he tells you that she was dead in Irwin County when he called the check on her on the full one morning call. Because he's the good Samaritan. Now, come on. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. 
But malice murder, again, that's what we are. The judge will tell you about implied malice. There is implied malice here. The deliberate intention to kill is that intent to harm someone can be formed in an instant. You have that here present, and the state has proven to you that by, out of his own mouth, and then by his conduct after what happens. Count two of the indictment is what's called felony murder. And count two charges him. Count two of the indictment is felony murder that he did during the commission of an aggravated assault. Aggravated assault, the judge will charge you as a felony. And when he strikes Miss Grinstead by use of an instrument being hands, Miss Miss Merchant charged said it was a deadly weapon. That's that's not how it's charged. It's an instrument. It is just an offensive weapon. A hand is an offensive weapon. She said deadly weapon in her closing argument, but that's not how it's charged in the indictment. Again, something else she got wrong. It's an offensive weapon when, when used against someone is likely to result in serious bodily injury. We know he does because she dies. And that's aggravated assault. And if you kill someone in the course of that, that's called felony murder. That's count two. You have another count of felony murder that in the course of a burglary, which is also a felony as the judge will charge you, that causes her murder. He tells you that in his own statement. He puts the venue in Irwin County. Her home is in Irwin County. All the agents told you that. You all know exactly where it is. There's not one single piece of evidence even he says she was already dead in the orchard in Fitzgerald. There's not one single piece of evidence. We'll talk about the car in a little bit, too. All the smoke and mirrors from that that they want to say. We'll talk about it. So count three of the indictment is a felony murder while in the course of the burglary. That he intended to um, enter her home with the intent to commit a theft therein. And count four... <coughs> Uh, the indictment is the aggravated assault count that he did use his hand as an offensive weapon. You see, his hand, an object which was used offensively. Doesn't say anything about a deadly weapon. Miss Merchant just got that wrong. As she did many other things. hand is an offensive weapon. Because when used offensively against someone else, it is likely to and can result in serious bodily harm. And the serious bodily harm here is her death. And in the course of that aggravated assault, he caused her death, which corresponds to count two, which is the felony murder. And count five, please, is burglary. Burglary is when someone enters your residence without authority or permission with the intent to commit a theft therein. The theft doesn't even have to occur. If someone enters your home and they are looking for something to steal and you catch them in the act, the burglary is complete. The judge will never say you have to get something out of the house before it's a burglary. That's not, that's not the law. If they enter your home with the intent to commit a theft, that is a burglary. His intent, he tells you, I was breaking in people's homes to steal money and I was going through her purse. That's a burglary. The state has proven to you that by his own statement. We're going to talk about corroboration of the statement in a little bit, too. But that is a burden. The state has proven to you each element of each of those offenses beyond a reasonable doubt that he's the one that did it. Because he tells you. His own mouth. His own handwriting. His own actions. He confesses. And then count six of the indictment is conceiving the death of another. But he did conceal the death of Miss Ray said of whether or not she was unlawfully killed by removing her body from 300 West Park Street in Osceola. He concealed her death when he takes it, as he says, and volunteers. Remember in that statement, people tell you what they want you to know, what they think is important to them. Right? That's, that's what you say to people. You want them to know what you think is important. And what does he tell Agent Shadell? Because, you know what, he's a nice, respectful guy to ladies. And that's what he wants Agent Shadell to understand. 
because he'll use those terms like, I gotta quit. After I hit her and struck her, and I left, I gotta, I gotta quit. Miss Greenstead, and I got a quilt. And we didn't burn their body beyond her. We cremated her. Because I'm a nice guy. I'm not that monster that I've hidden from everybody else. But he told him and volunteered that little detail. And that's an important detail because you know what? Agent Shadell doesn't talk about going and getting a quilt or going to not talk about that. He asked him about the gloves. How does he know it's translucent? How would he know that? How would he know that Bowen got a glove, a translucent glove, and then blamed it on him? It doesn't make sense. Smoke and mirrors. That's all that is. That's them hiding stuff from you. Agent Chanel just said, what about gloves? And he adds that other important detail. Translucent. Translucent. How do you know? Because he tells you on the witness stand, Bo didn't tell me anything about what happened. Bo never told me anything. Bo never told me anything other than he killed Tara. But he knew about a translucent glove that Bo supposedly planted on. Translucent. What? It could have been a driving glove, a leather glove, a winter glove. But he says, translucent. And what is it? Translucent. That's why you know he's guilty. So, you know, they had that little thing about the glove, all these questions. I'm not required to answer these questions. The judge will never say and anything he gives you. That I'm required to, I'm not. And that's not even reasonable doubt. The glove. How does the glove, glove corroborate that? How is he going to know about it? If he wasn't there and knew he used it, and, and then Agent Chanel asked him, is your DNA going to be on it? Yeah, it came from my house. How did he know? Bo didn't tell him he said that. How did he know that? Because he was there. He was the one that left it. He could have been talking about any kind of glove. But he knew it was translucent. an important detail that he wanted Agent Shadell to know. So let's talk about this confession and how it's corroborated. Let's talk about this glove. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very important for you to recall um, Lisa Hobgood, Crime Lab, 2005. Kind of silver hair, gray haired lady. You remember her? The forensic biologist from 2005. My, as, well, as she testified to you, my first case ever of what? Touch the DNA. We, we've done DNA with a lot of blood, a lot of semen, a lot of saliva, or sweat from a brim of a hat, but we've never done skin cell or touch DNA. Her first case she had ever worked So their theory, Bo Dukes, he knew to plant that glove so we could get some touch DNA off. Doesn't make any sense. But he knew his DNA would be on it. In fact, this defendant talks about that translucent glove and how it corroborates. And guess what Bo, if he planted it, also knew? Do you remember what Ashley Hinkle told you? She was the second biologist that tested the glove in 2017-18, somewhere one of those years, the, the later. 
She said, I swabbed the inside of the glove, and it was 90% Ryan Duke's DNA and 10% of Tara Grinstead's DNA. Consistent with Ryan having worn the inside of the glove. And if Bo just planted it, how did it get Tara's DNA on there unless that mixture of Ryan and Tara's DNA wasn't on there? Because he dropped them. It's what he used. And then you heard her say, I swabbed the outside of the glove. And do you remember what the percentages were on the outside of the glove? 50 50. 50% his and 50% Terry's. And also on the outside of that glove was someone's DNA. We, we don't know whose it is. I, I know the defense says that the state, the GBI, tried to exclude both. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm okay if you include both. Doesn't matter to me. Maybe it is Bo's DNA. I can't say that it isn't. I can't say that it is. But Bo just happened to get, plant this glove, the DNA right in percentages. And got Tara's DNA on the inside and the outside. When we didn't even know we could get DNA in 2005. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. They asked you to use common sense. That doesn't even fit politics. And so while we're talking about the glove, let's talk about Jared Lute, who went over to get his dog, and let's talk about um, Pete Dykes. All right, they want to say that that glove had to be planted and it had to be planted by, by Bo Dukes after Heath Dykes left. That's their theory. Because they would have seen it. What did Mr. Lou, a high school kid at the time, tell you? I went over there to get my dog. Is he looking for trash in somebody's yard? That, when, when you go up to somebody's house, are you looking for trash in their yard? Are you, look, you, you don't know. You're just going to get your dog. A high school kid. Going to be noticing trash in somebody's yard? just doesn't make sense. The glove was there. He just didn't see it. Just didn't see it. Because you're not looking for trash in somebody's yard. They don't even know Tara's missing at that point. No one does. Right? This is Sunday. People are calling for her. Miss Faye is desperately calling. Heath has been calling. No one knows she's missing. No one's looking for trash. No one's looking for evidence. They want to hold a high school kid, Jared Luke, who's going to get his dog bowl, his dog accessories as he was calling it. They want to hold him to the standard of investigators, looking around her yard for evidence of why she's... That, that's silly, ridiculous. No high school kid is doing that. And then they want to say that he dikes. He's a trained investigator, and he is. Ladies and gentlemen, Heath Dykes was concerned about one thing that night. The lady that he was having a relationship with was not calling him back. Y'all heard his desperation in his voice on those answering machine calls. In fact, he was. He was so desperate, he drove down here to find out why she wasn't returning his calls and why she wasn't calling him back. And it's, he told you what? What time was it? You remember? It was dark. In fact, I think he said close to midnight. So midnight, 1 a.m. on Saturday, and he says, we asked him, did you have a flashlight? No. He says, yeah, he did say, I think I would have seen it. He, he's not looking for, they're, they're, they're wanting to say he's out there searching for evidence on the ground outside. He is desperately knocking on that door, trying to get Tara to answer the door, calling her on the phone, leaving a car on the door. He's not looking outside in the yard for evidence in the case. That's not what he's there for. That glove was there. It's dark. He just didn't see it. He's not looking for trash in her yard at midnight. He's looking for her. He's looking for her. 
that's the most logical, and that makes sense. He just didn't see it. Because he's not looking for trash in her yard. Not. But must have been planted. And remember, something else important you got to remember. What does Heath Dykes tell you at midnight, Saturday night, Sunday? I checked the hood of her car. It's cold to the touch. The car hadn't gone anywhere. Been right there. Cold to the touch. Which means what? She hadn't been driving it. That's what that trained investigator did. He was looking for her and where she might have gone, or where, if, was she there, or where she was. Not looking for evidence in the yard of a piece of trash, a glove. Not looking for that. That doesn't come in until she doesn't show up for school. And then Joe Portier even tells, remember Mr. Portier, the older fella, older gentleman? Next door neighbor, good neighbor that everybody wants. Mr. Portier said, I even took the spare key over to the house and I didn't see the glove when I was walking up to her front door. He's not looking for that. He's looking for her, trying to find her. He says, no, when I came out of the house and I was calling Chief Hancock, that's when I saw it. I was standing on the front porch on the phone and I see it out in front of me. And it's morning. It's light outside. And it's there. That's what he tells you. That glove was there. The big secret, they don't like it because it makes their client guilty. So they have to come up with some other alternate theory. It must have been both. There's not been one witness from that witness stand that ever told you that both planted that glove. Not one. They just throw up conjecture and speculation hoping that that's what you'll follow. But you raised your hand and swore an oath to seek the truth. Not follow their red herrings and not follow their smoke and mirrors. So let's talk about the car since I'm on the car. They want to talk about the car that Mr. Olmstead and Mr. Harper. Y'all remember Mr. Olmstead and Mr. Harper? They testified right in the road. I, I cross-examined both of them. Mr. Harper said on direct that although she said it was midnight and one of them did in their closing that it was midnight, you'll, you'll remember the testimony. That's not what he testified to. He said he got up early that morning. I remember that because I cross-examined and I said, sir, in your statement to the GBI, you said you, you didn't get up until about noon. No, sir, I, I remember I got up that morning and I walked to the Swanee Swifty. Get something that morning. He didn't say midnight. Not what he said. But you, 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 you trust your notes. You trust your memory. Not what Ms. Murphy says and not what I said. You trust what you remember. But that's what I asked him on the witness stand. And he said, no, sir, that was that morning. And he said, after that, I don't know. And then they put up his roommate after him to say that he didn't see the car. He said it was that afternoon. Not that morning, that afternoon about, he said about three or four. Because you know why? He said, I slept till noon. He, he said that I, he, he, said, he admitted he slept till noon. That I said he didn't know what happened that morning. He didn't even remember his roommate getting up. Although his roommate's statement said it was about noon and testified here it was that morning. He just doesn't remember. Both of those good people, good people, not trying to like, just trying to be helpful. That's all. They're just wrong. Living there across the street, whatever day. It may have been that her car was gone or not. That they, they're just wrong. And then remember when I asked his roommate, and you and your you and your roommate went to Wendy's to get something to eat about four that afternoon. Yes, sir. And that's when you saw the car not there. Yes, sir. And his roommate didn't even say that. He said it was early that morning when he went to the Swanee Swifty. He didn't say he said nothing about Wendy's. They're, they're just they're just it's a long time ago. They're just mistaken. That's all it is. They're just mistaken. All of those other witnesses said the car was there when they drove by. Heath Dykes tells you it was cold to the touch when he was there. The car never left. The car's not an issue. In fact, if Ryan Duke's on statement to you, his videotape confession 
car is not an issue. They want to make the car an issue to make you look somewhere else away from the truth, away from his statement, away from the glove, his DNA, and his fingerprints, because the car, oh, we got to get the car out of there. we got to get her away from the house because she wasn't killed at the house, but, it's, but that's because it's, they need to get away from what, it's, what their plot says. They don't want to talk about that statement. Notice they didn't play the statement for you. They want to say hiding stuff from you. Why didn't they play something on it? Because they know the statement makes him guilty. That's why. So let's talk about the palm prints. It's his palm prints in the glove. So his DNA is in the glove at a 90 to 10%, a 50 50% on the outside, and also his palm prints in a glove. Now let's talk about this for a second. They want to say it's a plant. They get up here and they attack Miss Hinkle, who testifies that she found his DNA, and they want to say that, oh, they didn't follow procedures and didn't do this and did that. And then they want to attack Miss Worley about her identification that she really didn't identify. What innocent people only need one defense. If Bo planted it, so what if it's his DNA? So what? But they want to fight that too. Why? Because it makes their client guilty of all of it. With every question that they ask, with every witness that they call, you remember their client confessed. Who's hiding things from you? Who's trying to misdirect you and make you go a different direction? That table. With that defendant in that chair. Let's talk about her home. Ms. Grinstead, they want to say uh, there's no crime scene at the home and investigators couldn't tell. You know what? It's a fair statement. The investigators couldn't say one way or the other whether it's a crime scene or a sign of a struggle or not. Fair enough. I think that's a fair assessment of the evidence. But one interpretation of the evidence is that, in fact, there was a struggle there and that something happened in that bedroom or in that house, and that defendant told you it did. So there is physical evidence that supports that it happened in that house. What did Maria Hewlett tell you? Maria, I forgot her last name now. The alarm clock down on the floor blinking 12. What else did she tell you? Well, the other young lady that was there for the beauty patents, I forget her name at the moment, but pretty young lady that, that came in and, and talked to you about being over there. For, those drawers were pulled out. That's not the way out. She said she came back after they left. There were extra drawers pulled out in those dressers. Top drawer, bottom drawer. Where are you going to trip over when you leave that one out? And I agree with Mr. Merchant, ladies aren't going to leave those throw pillows on there. They're going to take those off. We're not saying she was asleep in the bed. We don't. What does he say? He says she came up behind him and surprised him. But that can be evidence of a struggle. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. So there is evidence in the home that there was a struggle. Oh, 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 oh. Remember where that glove was found in the border of the landscaping? What's in her bedroom floor? You want to tell me Tara Grin says going to leave pine straw laying around on her floor? Lampshade is askew. May or may not be anything, but it may be something. I mean, I turn mine, you probably turn yours to get some better lighting. But it may be. So even though we can't say that there definitely was, there is evidence that there could have been. In fact, drawers pulled out. And that chest is off center down there at the bottom of the bed. Right away when you trip over it. So 
Terry, or the young lady that testified that Terry was helping them with the beauty pad and said they didn't even get dressed in a bedroom. They got dressed in the kitchen area. Another shot George pulled out. And a candle on its side. A candle on its side. So again, the investigators want to be truthful with you. We, we can't say one way that, but there is evidence that something could have happened in that bedroom. And there's blood on the comforter. Let's talk about this phone call. The defense has to come up with a theory that explains that phone call because the GBI agents, Rothwell, Shadell, they all told you what? That's guilty knowledge. They hid that from everybody. So they've got to explain that phone call. So the way they come up with explaining it is he's a good Samaritan. You saw them attack the phone records. We were putting the phone, they didn't want those phone records in from North Coast Pay, the pay phone. They, didn't, they objected to, the, to those documents going into evidence. Who's trying to hide something from you? And then their client gets up on the stand and admits it, that he made it. Who's hiding stuff from you? Well, where is the smoke and mirrors? Sorry, Ms. Hart, go ahead. So you said you went to uh, what, what, what kind of phone did you use? It was a pipe phone. You know which show it was? Uh, the TNG, my own. The one out of the next effects? Yes, sir. So you went to the pipe phone that you said? Yes, sir. And you, how did you call the house? What did you do? I dialed 411 to get the number to uh, the answer. And, uh, heard by, uh, you were hoping that she would answer the phone. That is what she did. You knew something about her. What did you do to clean up? You said you will. The phone records. Why do you believe his statement, his videotape confession? Because the physical evidence corroborates it. Physical evidence doesn't lie to you. People will lie to you, no doubt. But physical evidence that corroborates it, just like you've got evidence corroborating a struggle in the, in the room, doesn't have to be, but it does. Phone records corroborate that phone call on our caller ID in the North Coast pay records. And he's the one in that statement that volunteers, I made a call. He asked him about phone calls. He does. Agent Shadell does. But then, you know what he says? I made a call from a pay phone. Not from Agent Shadell. Aunt the Swanee Swifty, just right here by our house. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about that just for a second. You're living in Fitzgerald by the hospital in a trailer. You're not going to dial from your home phone to check on this grandstead? What about a pay phone in Fitzgerald? You're going to drive 10 miles to Osceola? to make a call from a payphone? Just to return her purse. You don't go to the police and say, Miss Greenstead's purse, I found it, needs to get it returned to her. You don't go to the police in Fitzgerald and say that. You don't go to the sheriff's office in Ben Hill County and say, I've got Miss Greenstead's purse, just wanted to get it returned to her. You know something happens to you or y'all go check on it. Don't go to the Osceola Police Department when you get down here. You don't go to the Urban County Sheriff's Office. You go to a pay phone. Don't call from your home phone. You drive back down to the scene of the crime. And ladies and gentlemen, he tells you in his statement, that he calls her to, he told you on the witness stand he called her to check on her. He tells you in his statement he called because, remember what he said? No cops were around. Yeah, it's church time in Osceola, people going back and forth to church. He's calling to make, he, one, to disguise he was calling. 
this 411 comes up payphone. So if you call from his home phone, it's his number that comes up, or his relative. And he's calling to make sure nobody's found her body yet. That there aren't police already there. He doesn't leave a message, Mr. Instead, I have your, I have your purse. Found it. Wanted to check on you, make sure you're okay. <laughs> Hangs up. And ladies and gentlemen, to get that glove right, for Bo to plant it, in their theory of the case, it doesn't even make sense. Because Bo would have had to have planted it after Heath Dykes was there midnight Sunday morning and before Joe Portier sees it, before they all go over there, and get Tara's DNA and Ryan's DNA and Ryan's with Bo every time after that. It doesn't even compute. It's impossible. But that's what they're stuck with because that's what your client did. What else corroborates his statement? He tells you in his statement I knew who it was because of the picture on her wall. And guess what Tara had, as Agent Roster told you, or Agent Baudry, I think he said, I went and got her picture off her wall. If he wasn't in that house, how did he know? That she would have a picture of herself on her wall by herself. He doesn't say, I saw family pictures on the wall. I saw a picture of her on the wall. That's why you believe. Physical evidence doesn't lie. And what he tells you matches the physical evidence. The trash. The house. Blood on her comforter. You know, again, we can't tell you. I, I'm not trying to say whether it's menstrual blood, whether it's blood from this. Can't say but there's blood there. He wants to say it's consistent with sex or a monthly cycle. Maybe it is. You heard every witness. They, we, we can't tell you. But it's also some evidence that a struggle occurred there. Inside that bedroom, there's evidence that you can believe circumstantially and circumstantial evidence and direct evidence the judge will instruct you, you can give them the same way. Direct evidence is like he hit her. He confessed to doing it. That's direct evidence. Circumstantial evidence is other things that corroborate that and you give them equal weight. They're not different. You don't give them different weight. You can give them equal weight. In this video, talk about with his actions, with his motions, with his hands, he tells you what he did. You don't lie about that. He says, I picked her up and I carried her out of the house and I pulled her. She was so small. And he does this motion. she was home that night because these are the clothes she wore to the pageant. Picture of her at the pageant. 
coat she has there in her hand. tells you that he broke in her home because he's a drug addict, needing money for drugs. He also confesses to you in his own handwriting. And ladies and gentlemen, he doesn't say, I'm scared of bow dupes. He doesn't say, I'm scared from my family. That's something he's told you five years later. Never told that any of that to the police. Brian Duke. Words are useless. But I am burdened with the guilt of murdering Miss Greenstone. That picture, he's burdened with her guilt of murdering her. His own handwriting, his own words. He doesn't say burning her body or both forcing me to burn her body. He says murdering her. I am burdened with the guilt of murdering Miss Grinstead. I don't feel like I deserve to be free to breathe. I can't begin to comprehend the pain I have caused to her family and loved ones changed his mind about all that, apparently, as they still said. Months of misery, years of torment. I don't feel like I need to live with the pain I've caused. The things I have done are a double-edged sword with no handle. All that get near me are woefully injured. I can't take back the things I have done, but I hope today is the first step to being a good person. A title I don't deserve or merit. I am sorry for everything. The stupid, cowardly way I have hidden the truth. Still hiding it today. He hid it for 12 years. And he continues five years later, still hiding the truth. May God forgive me because I can't and won't. He confessed to burning her body. And while we're talking about burning her body, I want to talk about a few things. Let's talk about motives. I couldn't stand before you and tell you that Bo Dukes is a good person. He ain't in good South Georgia language. Is Bo Dukes a liar? Yes. In fact, in Wilcox County, Georgia, see that name at the bottom down there? It says Bradford L. Rigby District Attorney. That, that's me. He was charged with making a false statement, count one, that he did, false, false and a cover up that he confessed, cover up that Ryan Duke had confessed to him that, that Ryan Alexander Duke killed Tara Green said a material fact in her disappearance. Until late to do. He was also in Wilcox County charged with making a false statement, hindering the apprehension of Ryan Duke and concealing the death of another. Four different counts. Bo Dukes was convicted of in Wilcox County and is in prison for, as they marched him in here in his prison clothes, paraded him before you as some big spectacle for the media. But that's what media lawyers do. Convicted in Wilcox County and is serving a sentence of 25 years. Did I hide him from you? I didn't hide him from you. I'm not going to put a convicted liar on the witness stand.
He would look at me like I was crazy, putting up a man I convicted for lying. And lying about the fact that he covered up Ryan's confession. Hide anything from you? And they knew good well he was going to take the Fifth Amendment. He's got pending charges in Ben Hill County. He had his lawyer here. Of course he's going to take the Fifth Amendment. They want to talk about their client and his rights. He has rights too. Of course he is. That was all for you, for a show, for drama, for television. That's all it's about. Bo Dukes is not a good person. Never said he was. Never heard that come out of my mouth, Ms. Hart's mouth, or any other witnesses. Not because it's not the truth. He's not a good person. He's a liar. I've convicted him of lying. Charged him with lying. Convicted him of lying. He's got a bad reputation. I don't dispute that. But let's talk about it. Who's his best friend? Every time I see one, I see the other one. They're always together. Ladies and gentlemen, you, they, they made you think this was about power and influence and Bo's family having power and influence. The man serving 25 years in prison and Bo had so much power, he was living in a trailer with Ryan Duke. His family, Ryan even told you his mom had kicked him out. His family didn't want anything to do with him. He had such power and influence. Not, they were talking about power and influence. That, oh, the state was influenced by Representative Duke Hudson from the grave, apparently. So much, so influential. Bo Dewey's got 25 years in prison. That's how influential. He still has pending charges. Not one email, not one text, not one phone call from anybody that they put into evidence to show power and influence in how this case was done. Because it doesn't exist. You hold them to that too. If they're going to tell you they're going to prove something, prove it. They can't. Didn't happen. Maybe fun to talk about, fun to think about conspiracies and how that didn't happen. Bo Dukes is not a good person, but who's his best friend? Who's always with him? Who lived with him before and after the murder? Who even went to the ABAC and lived in the dorm with him? This defendant. Oh, I don't even know how to get away from him, get out of it. Oh, I'm going to live with him in ABAC in the dorm. After all, after he's ruined my life and made me tear against him. Scared of Bo. I'm scared of Bo. And ladies and gentlemen, if Bo had done this, Bo doesn't need Ryan's help. It's Bo's truck, Bo's orchard. Ryan needs Bo's help. He didn't have a vehicle to carry her body. He had to get Bo's. He put her out on Bo's family's property. He needed those help. Ladies and gentlemen, they put in a conviction for Bo Dukes for stealing from the military. And he did. He's convicted of it. I'm never going to tell you he's not a thief and not a good person and not a liar. He is. Convicted of it. Best friend, that was Ryan Duke. What did Ryan tell you? Ryan didn't steal from the military. He stole from his own brother. Remember what he told you? I forged some checks on my brother. Don't you think if he just asked his brother, hey, can I have $50? He'd have given him $50? Of course his brother would. Stephen Dukes is a good person. But he stole from it. You want to talk about character? That's character. Bo steals, Ryan steals. I can tell you 
They want to talk about character evidence. Everybody said Ryan was peaceable and Ryan's truthful. They put in some witnesses to say he had good character, but they knew him back in high school. Not really around this time, but fair enough. They put the evidence in. There's a man that would have had 11 character witnesses walk down here and come up on the witness stand and raise their hand and say, this man is truthful and honest. He wouldn't do anything. He's a person of good character. We trusted him. We would trust him with our money. In fact, we do trust him with our money. And they would have all testified to his good character. But that same person is the one that betrayed with a kiss. In the garden. All of the disciples would have said, not Judas. As he was the thief. They didn't know that about his character. Right? They were even asking at the upper room, who, who would do this? Because sometimes people hide who they are. Just like he did. Bo was just open about his deviance. But his best friend just hides it better. You all know people like that. They go to church and they're one way and they're out of church, they're something else. They just hide it a little better than others. Bo's just out front with who he is. Remember Garland Lott, young man that was their high school friend out at the orchard? They want to talk about Ryan getting up and crying about helping burn her body. But two to three weeks after it happened, what was Ryan doing about it? Laughing. The statement was, again, Mr. Lott told you, I can't remember who said it. It was one of them, they were both in the truck, and one of them said, we killed her and we burned her body. And they were both laughing about it. As he laughed in this courtroom. That's how much he respected women and respected Tara Grinstead. That's who he is. Says he's not a liar. He's a truthful person. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard him on the witness stand. We impeached him with his own lies out of his own mouth. You told Zach Gerard on a phone call, and you heard the phone call, that, and this is his respect for women. He's on a phone call that he knows is recorded saying, I had sex, I screwed Tara Grinstead, and I was screwing her from high school. Oh, but that's all a lie. Because that's about the media. Living in his trailer, he goes and lives at A back with. 
And then you just proved that he was telling you the truth because Zane Deal came in here and Cliff Benson came in here and said, I've never been to a house where Bo and Ryan lived in in Fitzgerald. Not the trailer, not the house. And they, he, Bo never said any of that to me. Who's lying to you? Who, who stands to lose the most? Didn't happen. And, and they said that, you know, he testified, you know, heaven forbid they got off script. I mean, we lost our pages for a few minutes and we just couldn't even continue the testimony because we got off script. Who's playing games with you? They want to attack the DNA, attack the fingerprints, but then, well, of course, the gloves plan it. An innocent man just needs one defense. They don't need, oh, it's not that, it's not his DNA, it's not his fingerprints, it's not this, it's not that, it's not. It's planted. Not his phone call. He didn't make that phone call. Don't want the phone call. Oh, he's going to admit, he made the phone call. We're going to put up Dr. Talitsky to talk about the statement and how Jason Shadell used all these terrible techniques and everything else, and then they're going to put their client and say, I was, I was just going in there to confess. Why? Smoke and mirrors, ladies and gentlemen. And apparently, since his personality assessment, that you've probably all taken one like, apparently he's changed on the stand. Just smoke and mirrors. Not one expert from DNA or fingerprints that they call to say it wasn't his print or wasn't his DNA. Not one. They could have. Let's talk about the door lock. Let's talk about our shoes and yoga pants since they want to talk about those things. I'm not required to prove those or answer any questions about those, but let's talk about it because I'm not afraid of it. I'm not hiding anything from you. There was evidence that, yes, she would normally lock that top lock. What did Maria Hewlett, I, I can't remember her married name now. What did she tell you, though, her best friend? If she was expecting company, she wouldn't lock the top off. And ladies and gentlemen, we, we all have habits, and you know what? There are times when I forget to lock my front door. And maybe if I'm not ready to go to bed yet, maybe if I'm still up and moving about in my house, I'm not going to lock my front door even though that's my habit. It just hasn't been done yet. There's not one person that's come in here to you and told you that she locked that lock that night. Not one. Brian Duke burned her in her yoga pants. And did you see Maria? No, so Maria also told you, as you remember, when Maria testified, she said, um, Tara and I locked ourselves out of that house. Sometimes we just use a credit card to pop it. It was easy. What did Ryan tell you in his statement? It was easy. Pop it. The credit card. Oh, what, what, was, what was their response to that? Did you check and see if Ryan ever had a credit card? Who, who's playing games with you in smoke and mirrors? Does it have to be his credit card? Can he just get his dad's or his brother's or, or stolen one from the houses he's broken into? Just, just games they play. Seek the truth. Be truth seekers, not doubt seekers. He confessed his DNA. We talked about that on the glove. 90%, 10% on the inside, 50-50 on the outside. We had that in 2000. We had his DNA in 2005, ladies and gentlemen. Just didn't have it matched to him at that point. But we had an unknown male contributor's DNA in 2005, and when we tested it in 2015, 17, 18, And the guilty knowledge we kept back on is not only did we have the unknown male's DNA, we had pairs on it as well which shows you that Ryan Duke came in contact with Tara Grinstead.
and it had to be before they burned the body. That's why that glove corroborates. It is physical evidence doesn't lie to you. People will lie to you every day. Physical evidence does not. He confessed to making that phone call. Palm print on the glove. He confessed when he took them to the orchard. In fact, you'll remember in that video, the GBI tent is already set up of where they're digging at the first location, as Ty Crosby told you about it, and he even walks by it. He says, no, it's not over there, it's going to be on over here. If he was just going to agree with them where it was and what was done, what's he going to do? Just agree with where they're already at. No, that, that's it. But no, he shows them and take. And Jason at one point says, well, we'll just follow you. And he's not cognizant because he's taken Vicodin, Percocet, marijuana, all of these drugs. And he's out there walking in briars and everything else in slide shoes. In fact, he even has the presence of mind to know that his pants are falling down and wants to pick him up because he doesn't like saggy pants. But he's blitzed out of his mind on all these drugs. Doing that. That's what they want you to believe. And you had two agents, Agent Shadell and Agent Holland, tell you he exhibited no signs of impairment. And you saw him on video. Doesn't slur his speech or unresponsive to questions. Sometimes he says he doesn't know. But he doesn't make up a crazy story. It doesn't fit with the question of in fact, he corrects Agent Shadell according to the testimony of um, the GBI inspector yesterday. We corrected him 21 times. In that statement. They put Dr. Chalitsky up to say that he was blitzed out of his mind. And then he gets up there and tells you, after all that defense and theory... The, oh, the statement, you can't believe it because he was on so many drugs and, and Miss Merchant even told you in the close that we don't even really know how many drugs he was on or what he was on or if he took a pain pill. We don't even know because he lies. He says on his statement, a pain pill this morning, and it's the afternoon when the interview goes, he says a pain pill. And he's already told you he's a drug addict, so his tolerance is going to be high. And he says, I'm fully cognitive. He confessed to you in his handwriting. He confessed to you with his actions of how showing you. you. You don't make that up if you didn't do it. This is how I get I have no illusions about that. His words, his name, his confession. This is why you know he's guilty. Because there, are, oh, he also says in his statement, there's not a lot of blood at the house. If he thinks Bo Dukes killed her, and Bo Dukes didn't tell him how he killed her, because that's what he testified to, how is he going to know that there's not a lot of blood at the house? How do you know that? Unless you were there and you did it. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you one other thing. The judge is going to charge you on party to the crime, someone directly or participates in it, that they're just as guilty as others. You may believe that Bo Dukes and Ryan went over there together and killed them together. You may believe that. And that's okay if you do. But it doesn't make his guilt any different. He still is guilty. If not, 
And you may believe that Bo went in that house with him and they did it together. You may believe that. And that's okay. But it doesn't change that he's guilty, too. Judge will charge you on parties to the crime. One knowing and directly committing or participating in is just as guilty as the other. Ms. Green said that they wanted to argue that this case was about power and influence. This killer, this murderer, right here in this chair, this Ryan dude that confessed to you, that night in her home, he had all the power. Tara was powerless. He had all the influence that night. He's had all the influence over her family. From 2005 to 2022, he's had the power and the influence. He did everything he could to erase the very memory of Tara Grinstead and who she was, the teacher that she was, the career that she was pursuing, the children that she was affecting. He took her from her sister, he took her from his mom, his stepmom, and her father. And he even tells you in his statement, I've kept her from being a mom and a grandmother and enjoying life. I took that from her. He had the power. And he had the power over her in her house that night. He has had that influence over her, influence over her family, as they have been tortured. You heard the desperation in Miss Faye's voice in those answering machine messages, the desperation in Keith Dyke's voice. This is what he's done. This is why his guilt was overwhelming. This is his character. He just hit it better than that. They're both thieves. And they're both enemies. And they're both burning fire. In fact, they wanted to erase Miss Grinstead's memory so much that they reduced her to a bomb. They burned her body, a full skeleton, down to about 20 fragments of bone. A little piece of vertebra, cranium, and took the smile from beauty patterns and reduced her to a few teeth. They wanted to erase the memory of Tara Grinstead and who she was and what she had done so much that they burned her to just little pieces. We couldn't save Tara Grinstead in her home that night. We didn't have any power to save her. We didn't have any influence to save her that night in her home. He had that. And he took it from her. He took her soul from her. He took her life from her. One of God's souls. He took it from her. As he struck her with his hand and left her, he came back and got her body and took it out to the orchard where he got his window. Burn it. Burn it to a crisp where DNA can't even be extracted from. But today, in this courtroom, Justice has the power. The law has the influence. 
and you as the jury have power to honor Taylor's memories. You have the power to seek the truth and to do the right thing. They ask you to seek doubt. I ask you to be a truth seeker. The truth is, just as he told you in his confession, he murdered Terry Grinson as he burglarized her home. He struck her, removing her life. And then just covered up, he got her body out and took her to the orchard where he burned it beyond recognition. Today, Osceola, Georgia, has been, had an influx of media, an influx of media since this has begun. And today, Osceola, in Oregon County, are truth seekers. And you can honor Tara's memory. You have the power and influence today to honor her memory, to honor Mr. Billy, to honor Miss Connie, to honor Alita, to honor her mother. They wanted to reduce her memory to trash in little pieces of bubble. But you can tell the media all over the United States and all over the world from Osceola, Urbanville, Lax, and Ray, and Mystic. The truth is what we do in Osceola. And you see the verdict that speaks the truth today. There's only one verdict in this case that speaks the truth. If that verdict is for you to find this defendant in that chair guilty of being a murderer, that's the verdict that speaks the truth. And you let your verdict shine as bright as the fire that burned her with. And you find him guilty. Take a five minute indoor recess, uh, come back for the charge, and then we'll break for lunch. If you'll please adjourn to the jury room, please. All right, we'll be in recess five minutes.
right. Um, Mr. Norton, if there's any folks out there on the landing or anything that want to come in, tell them to come on in. Uh, God, of course, that's fine. But, uh, If there's anybody else who wants to, that's fine, but I just didn't want to. Yeah, you can let them in if they come up. Yeah, sure. I just didn't want 15 coming in here at one time. All right. Um, ask the jury to join us, please. Um, I'm sorry. Hang on a second. I apologize. Can I ask something? Um, I noticed in the jury charge you gave us again this morning that you did not include any requested language in the sweat case. Given, given the argument that was made by Specifically to the inferences they can make from his indications to commemorate, I was just once again asking for it to give us another charge. Thank you. That's what we will do. Jury. All right. Ask the jury to join us, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, uh, you are considering the case of the state of Georgia versus Ryan Alexander Duke. Mr. Duke was indicted by the grand jury of this county on April the 12th, 2017, uh, with the crimes charged of malice, murder, two counts of felony murder, aggravated assault, burglary, concealing the death of another. You'll have this indictment out with you. Uh, during your deliberations. I'm going to go over the law, the charge with you at this time. Make notes if you want to, don't if you don't want to. I'm also going to send this charge out with you so you'll have it back there. Uh, some of these things are, can be a little confusing, so I've, if you need it during your deliberations, I want you to have it. Now, Mr. Duke enters uh, upon this case with the presumption of innocence in his favor, and he's entered his plea of not guilty this indictment and that plea of not guilty is what forms the issue for you to decide. That's why you're here. I caution you again that the fact that the grand jury has indicted him is no evidence of guilt and you should not consider the indictment as evidence or draw any implication of guilt simply from the fact that he's been indicted, neither is his plea of not guilty to be considered as evidence. His innocence, his presumption of innocence, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that he enters upon this trial with his life is obviously in his favor, and that presumption remains with him until it is overcome by the state with evidence sufficient to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of his guilt on the crimes charged. No person, ladies and gentlemen, in our country shall be convicted of any crime unless and until each element of the crimes charged are proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And the burden of proof in that regard lies with the state to prove every material allegation of the indictment and every essential element of the crimes charged beyond a reasonable doubt. There's no burden whatsoever on a defendant to prove innocence, and the burden never shifts to a defendant to introduce evidence or prove innocence. If a defense is raised by the evidence, the burden is on the state to negate or disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. However, as I'm sure you might imagine, the state is not required to prove the guilt of an accused beyond all doubt or to some mathematical certainty. A reasonable doubt means just like it sounds. It is a doubt of a fair-minded, impartial juror who is honestly seeking the truth. That's the first thing they teach you in law school. 
is that the point of all legal investigation is the discovery of the truth. That's what a trial is. A reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen, is a doubt that is based upon your common sense and reason. It does not mean some vague or arbitrary doubt, but is it, it is a doubt for which a reason can be given, arising from your consideration of the evidence presented, a lack of evidence, conflict in the evidence, or any combination thereof. If after you give consideration to all the facts and circumstances of this case, if your minds are wavering, unsettled, or unsatisfied, that is a doubt of the law, and you should acquit Mr. Duke. But if that doubt does not exist in your mind as to his guilt, then you would be authorized to convict him. If the state, however, fails to prove Mr. Duke's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, it is your duty to acquit him. Now, as I told you when we started, it's my job to uh, determine the law applicable to this case and charge you or instruct you on it. Uh, and you are bound by these instructions. It's your responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, to determine the facts of the case. And then you apply this law that I give you to the facts as you find them to be. Mr. Duke, ladies and gentlemen, is charged with certain crimes against the laws of our state. Now, a crime is a violation of a statute of this state in which two things are operating, an act and an intention, okay? Intent is an essential element of any crime that must be proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt. Intent may be shown in many ways provided you believe it exists from the proven facts that have been presented to you. It may be inferred by you from the proven circumstances or by acts and conduct, or it may be, in your discretion, inferred when it is simply the natural and necessary consequence of the act. Whether you draw such an inference is a matter solely and totally within your discretion. Now, criminal intent does not mean an intent to violate a specific law or a specific statute. It simply means the intent to commit the act that is prohibited by law or statute. You are not to presume that Mr. Duke acted with any criminal intent, but you may find that intention or its absence upon your consideration of words, conduct, demeanor, motive, or all other circumstances connected with these acts for which Mr. Duke is being prosecuted. You've heard a lot of talk about evidence. The oath I gave y'all last Monday morning that you took in that box requires you to decide this case on the evidence. Evidence is the means, ladies and gentlemen, by which any fact that is put in issue is either established or disproved. It includes all the witnesses' testimony, all the witnesses that came in here and were sworn testified before you, and it includes the exhibits that were tendered and admitted into the evidence in the case. Again, it does not include the indictment. It does not include Mr. Duke's plea of not guilty. It does not include the opening statements, the closing remarks you just heard, nor the questions of the attorneys. Now, we have two forms of evidence. We have what's called direct evidence, and then we have what's known as circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is the testimony of any person who asserts that he or she has actual knowledge of a fact, such as a eyewitness or something they personally observe. Circumstantial evidence is facts and circumstances that tend to prove or disprove other facts by inference. One of the best examples I've ever heard, ladies and gentlemen, is if you're at home late this afternoon, sitting on your porch, and some clouds blow up and the wind starts blowing and it starts raining and you're sitting there watching it, well then you can go to court the next day and give direct evidence that it rained at your house this afternoon at five o'clock. You saw it. But if you're out at your house and the wind starts blowing, the clouds blow up and you go back inside and take a nap, but when you get up, you come back on the porch and the grass is wet and there's puddles everywhere, that's circumstantial evidence that it rained at your house at that time. You didn't see it rain, but you saw other facts and circumstances which could tend to prove that. There's no legal difference, ladies and gentlemen, in the weight that you should give either 
to direct or circumstantial evidence. And in considering the evidence that's been presented to you in this trial, you should use your common sense and reasoning to make deductions and reach your conclusions. Don't be overly concerned about whether the evidence is direct or circumstantial. But you would only be authorized to convict Mr. Duke in this case only if the evidence, whether direct, circumstantial, or both, excludes all reasonable theories of innocence and proves his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, as to credibility of the witnesses, ladies and gentlemen, that's solely up to you. You must determine the credibility or the believability of the witnesses. And in deciding this, the law authorizes you to consider several factors, including all the facts and circumstances of the case, including the witnesses' manner of testifying, their intelligence, their means and opportunity for knowing the facts they came in here and testified about, the nature of the facts about which they testified, and the probability or improbability of their testimony, their interest or lack of interest in the outcome in this case, and their personal credibility as it was presented to you from your observations. Now, in determining witness credibility, ladies and gentlemen, you may consider evidence offered to attack or challenge the credibility or believability of a witness. This would include any character evidence for untruthfulness shown by the opinion of others through reputation evidence, specific instances of conduct of the witnesses brought out on cross-examination of that or of another witness that may relate to the witness's character for untruthfulness. Further, you may consider any evidence of bias towards a party, as it may have been shown by any bad acts or specific instances of conduct of the witness that related to the witness's bias towards one side or the other of this case. You may also consider any felony convictions or other convictions involving dishonesty, that being proof that a witness has been convicted of the offense of making false statements, hindering apprehension or punishment of a criminal, concealing the death of another, and conspiracy. Further, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes a witness credibility is attacked by one side or the other, and this is called impeachment. To impeach a witness is to show that the witness is unworthy of belief, and the witness may be impeached by disproving the facts to which the witness testified. Another assessment you may make, ladies and gentlemen, of a witness's credibility may be affected by comparing the testimony that the witness gave in this chair to statements the witness made before trial. It's for you to decide whether there is some reasonable explanation for any inconsistency in a witness's pretrial statements when compared to what they said in this courtroom. Now, further as to credibility, ladies and gentlemen, a witness who has had their credibility attacked by one side or the other or challenged, as I have described to you, you may also consider any evidence offered to support that witness's credibility, which would include, as opposed to evidence of character for untruthfulness, evidence of character for truthfulness. This may be shown, likewise, by the opinion of other witnesses, may be shown by reputation evidence, or specific instances of conduct of the witness in question brought out on cross-examination of that or another witness that may relate to that witness's character for truthfulness. Also, any evidence you may have observed about lack of bias the witness may have had towards one side or the other. This, likewise, could be shown by truthful conduct or other specific instances of conduct of the witness that relates to their lack of bias toward a party. Just like with all other instances and examples of credibility, ladies and gentlemen, in your analysis, you should apply your common sense and reason to decide what testimony you believe and what testimony you don't believe. We've had a number of expert witnesses, ladies and gentlemen. I tried to call those to your attention as they were presented. Expert witnesses are those who, because of their training and experience, possess knowledge in a particular field that is not common 
or known to the average citizen, and the law permits expert witnesses to give opinions based on that training and experience. You are not required, as I've told you throughout the trial, to accept the testimony of any witness, expert or otherwise. Testimony of an expert, just like that with all witnesses, is to be given only the weight and credibility that you think it is properly entitled to receive. Now, as to the defendant's pretrial statement, ladies and gentlemen, a statement that the defendant allegedly made while in custody has, of course, been offered for your consideration. Before you may consider that as evidence for any purpose, you must determine whether the statement was voluntary and whether the defendant was properly advised of his constitutional rights. To be voluntary, a statement must be freely and willingly given without coercion, duress, threats, use of violence, fear of injury, or any suggestion or promises of leniency or reward. A statement that is induced by the slightest hope of benefit or the remotest fear of injury is not voluntary. To be voluntary, a statement must be the product of a free will and not under compulsion or any necessity imposed by anybody else. In determining voluntariness, you may also consider to what extent the defendant was informed of his or her rights, as I will discuss with you in a moment. You may also consider, ladies and gentlemen, the legality, the duration, and the conditions of any detention as factors relevant to the question of whether or not the statement was freely and voluntarily made. However, under the law, in order for a statement to be excluded because of illegal detention, it must be shown that the statement was in fact induced by that illegal detention. The burden of proof, like every other element, ladies and gentlemen, rests upon the state to establish that the statement was voluntary, that is, freely and willingly made. If you do not find Mr. Duke's statement was voluntary, you may not consider it for any purpose. Now, if you find that the statement the defendant made while in custody and as a result of his questioning was voluntary, you must also determine whether he was advised of his constitutional rights and whether he clearly understood and gave up those rights. The constitutional rights law enforcement must explain and the defendant must understand and voluntarily give up before any custodial statement is taken by law enforcement or as follows. The defendant has a right to remain silent. The defendant, uh, if he chooses to remain silent or if he chooses not to remain silent, excuse me, anything he says or writes can be used against him as evidence in court. That he has a right to consult with an attorney before any questioning and to have the lawyer present with him at all times during questioning and if he does not have resources to hire an attorney, that a lawyer will be provided for him to represent him before any questioning and to be present with him during any questioning. Likewise, on this issue, the burden is with the state to establish that all of these warnings that I just gave you were given, that they were understood and knowingly given up, given up by Mr. D. Now, if you find that the defendant's statement was voluntary, as I've described to you, and that all the warnings of his constitutional rights were given, and that he understood the meaning of what was said and knowingly gave up those rights, then you may consider that statement as evidence. If so, then you must apply the general rules for testing the believability of witnesses and decide what weight, if any, that you will give to any or all parts of the evidence. If you fail to find that Mr. Duke was properly informed of these rights and that he understood and gave up those rights, you must disregard his pretrial statement entirely and give it no consideration in reaching your verdict. As to corroboration of a defendant's out-of-court statement, a defendant's out-of-court statement that is not supported by other evidence is not sufficient to justify a conviction, even if you believe the unsupported statement. 
However, proof by other evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the crime alleged has been committed may constitute supporting evidence of a defendant's statement should you so find. The law does not fix the amount of supporting necessary, supporting evidence necessary. You must determine whether or not the evidence sufficiently supports the defendant's statement so has to justify a conviction. If you find there was a statement made by the defendant that was supported by other evidence, the degree of proof necessary to convict is that you be satisfied of the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. You should consider, ladies and gentlemen, with great care and caution the evidence of any out-of-court statement allegedly made by Mr. Duke, offered by the state. You may believe such a statement in whole or in part, believing that which you find to be true and rejecting that which you find to be untrue. You alone have the duty to apply the general rules for testing the believability of witnesses and to decide what weight should be given to all or any part of that evidence. As to parties to a crime in Georgia, ladies and gentlemen, every party to a crime may be charged and convicted of the commission of the crime. A person is a party to a crime only if that person directly commits the crime or intentionally helps in the commission of the crime or intentionally advises, encourages, hires, counsels, or procures another to commit the crime or intentionally causes another person to commit the crime under such circumstances that the other person is not guilty of any crime, either in fact or because of any legal incapacity. Any party to a crime, ladies and gentlemen, who did not directly commit the crime may be prosecuted for commission of the crime upon proof that the crime was committed and that the person was a party to it, even though the person alleged to have directly committed the crime has not been prosecuted or convicted, has been convicted of a different crime or degree of crime, is not amenable to justice, or who has been acquitted. Now, knowledge on the part of a defendant, ladies and gentlemen, that the crimes charged in an indictment and against them were being committed and that the defendant knowingly and intentionally participated in or helped in the commission of such a crime must be proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find from the evidence in this case that Mr. Duke had knowledge that crime was being committed or that he did not knowingly and intentionally commit or participate or help in the commission of the offense, then it is your duty to acquit him. If he had no knowledge the crime was being committed and did not knowingly and intentionally commit, participate or help in the participation of the crime or commission of the crime, it's your duty to acquit him. On the other hand, if you find beyond a reasonable doubt that he had knowledge that the crimes charged were being committed and that he knowingly and intentionally participated or helped in the commission of it, then you would be authorized to convict him. It's for you, ladies and gentlemen, as to the identification of Mr. Duke, it is for you to say whether under the evidence in this case, the testimony of the witnesses and the facts and circumstances sufficiently identify Mr. Duke beyond a reasonable doubt as the perpetrator of the alleged crimes or that he was a party to it. It is not necessary that the defendant show that another person committed the alleged offenses. Now, if you do not believe that Mr. Duke has been sufficiently identified as the person who committed the alleged crimes or was a party to it, or if you have any reasonable doubt about that, then it is your duty to acquit Mr. Duke in this case. Once again, the burden of proof rests with the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the identity of this defendant, Mr. Duke, as the person who committed the crimes alleged in this indictment. Now, as to the fingerprints and palm prints, that's all the same thing. Certain evidence of fingerprint and palm print comparison has been admitted by the court for your possible consideration. Identification by fingerprint and palm print comparison is opinion evidence and is dependent upon the credibility 
and accuracy of the expert witnesses called for that purpose, as well as the following factors. The validity of the theory of identification of fingerprint comparison. The credibility of the witness who performs other necessary functions in making the comparison, such as inked fingerprint impressions and latent lips. And the accuracy of procedures in identifying, preserving, recording, and maintaining the integrity of the physical evidence. All of these are questions for your consideration. Fingerprint evidence, ladies and gentlemen, is also governed by the rules of circumstantial evidence. Now, if you believe the fingerprints or palm prints corresponding to those of Mr. Duke were found and identified, their evidentiary value, if any, would be diminished to the extent that they could reasonably, reasonably have been left on the article alleged, that being the glove, at a time or under circumstances that would be consistent with his innocence. A verdict of guilty may not rest upon fingerprint identification alone unless you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the fingerprint and palm prints left by Mr. Duke were in fact found and that they could only have been impressed by Mr. Duke on the article alleged at the time of the commission of the crime and that such identification under all of the facts and circumstances of this case is sufficient to satisfy your mind, mind of Mr. Duke's guilt to the exclusion of any other reasonable theory and beyond a reasonable doubt. DNA evidence, ladies and gentlemen, has been considered, has been submitted for your consideration. Identification by DNA comparison is likewise considered opinion evidence and governed by the laws concerning opinion testimony that I've given you from as to expert witnesses. And as opinion testimony, ladies and gentlemen, evidence relating to DNA comparison is dependent upon many factors. Among those are the credibility and accuracy of the witnesses who were involved in the process of obtaining, identifying, preserving, recording, and maintaining that physical evidence. And upon the accuracy and validity of the testing procedures themselves that were used to perform, that were used to form such opinions. All of these are issues and matters for you to consider and determine. It's for you to determine the way, if any, that you will give the evidence related to the DNA comparison in reaching your decisions in this case. You've heard evidence, ladies and gentlemen, of good character on behalf of Mr. Duke. You have heard evidence for particular traits in that regard, more specifically peacefulness and truthfulness in an effort to show that Mr. Duke likely acted in keeping with those character traits at pertinent times or with reference to the issues in this case. This evidence is, authorized, is offered to you in the form of opinion of other witnesses and by evidence of reputation. You should consider any such evidence in this regard along with all the other evidence in deciding whether or not you have any reasonable doubt as to the guilt of Mr. Duke in this case. Now facts and circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, that merely place a defendant, place upon a defendant a grave suspicion of a crime charged or that merely raise a speculation or conjecture of a defendant's guilt are not sufficient to authorize a conviction. Further, a jury is not authorized to find a person who was merely present at the scene of the commission of a crime at the crime of its perpetration guilty of consent in and concurrence in the commission of the crime unless the evidence shows you beyond a reasonable doubt that such person committed the crime, helped in the actual perpetration of the crime, or participated in the criminal endeavor. Further, ladies and gentlemen, the jury is not authorized to find a person who was merely associated with other persons involved in the commission of a crime guilty of consent in or concurrence in the commission of the crime unless the evidence shows beyond a reasonable doubt that such person helped in the actual perpetration of the crime or otherwise participated 
in the criminal endeavor. As to statute of limitations, ladies and gentlemen, in our state, the law of our state sets a time upon which the state, a time limit, excuse me, upon which the state has to start the prosecution of most criminal offenses. In counts four, five, and six, the aggravated assault, burglary, and concealing the death of another, Mr. Duke is on trial uh, under those
You've heard in the arguments about venue. Uh, our Constitution in this state requires that any criminal actions uh, be tried in the county where they allegedly occurred. Venue, that is, that the crime was committed in Irwin County, Georgia, is a jurisdictional fact which must be proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt, just as any other elements of the offenses charged, and this may be done by direct or circumstantial evidence or both. Now, as to the murder charges, ladies and gentlemen, murder shall be considered as having been committed in the county in which the cause of death was inflicted. If it cannot be determined in which county the cause of death was inflicted, venue is proper and may be proved in the county in which the death occurred. If a dead body is discovered in this state and it cannot be readily determined in what county the cause of death was inflicted, venue is proper and may be pr proved in the county in which the dead body was discovered. Now, as to the form of your verdict, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see when you get in the jury room, there's a place on this indictment for you to fill out a verdict form. I don't want you to use that one. I've prepared a separate verdict form that I've been over with everybody. This will go out with you. This will be where you record your verdict. And in that regard, you should reach it as follows. First, as to count one, the malice murder charge, if after you consider all the testimony and circumstances and evidence presented to you, together with this charge, if you should find and believe beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Duke did in Irwin County, Georgia, on or about October 23, 2005, commit the offense of malice murder, as it is alleged in count one of this indictment, you would be authorized to find Mr. Duke guilty of this charge of the indictment. And in that event, the form of your verdict would be, we the jury find the defendant guilty of count one of the indictment, and so record your verdict. But if you do not believe that Mr. Duke is guilty of malice murder, as it's alleged in this indictment, in count one, or if you have any reasonable doubt in your mind as to his guilt on this charge, it is your duty to acquit him of malice murder. And in that event, the form of your verdict would be, we the jury find the defendant not guilty of count one of the indictment and so record your verdict on this verdict form. That analysis, ladies and gentlemen, you should use on each count and consider each count separate and distinct. Now, you are only, ladies and gentlemen, to concern yourself with the guilt or innocence of Mr. Duke in this case. Uh, you are not to be concerned about uh, any punishment. Uh, one of the first things you ought to do uh, in the jury room is select one of your number to serve as a full person. Uh, the full person uh, will preside over your deliberations and is called upon to uh, fill out, sign this verdict to which all 12 of you must freely and voluntarily agree. I hope that, ladies and gentlemen, you will open your deliberations and conduct your deliberations with an open mind. You should consult with each other, and you should consider each other's views. Each of you, however, has to decide this case for yourself, but you should only do that after a discussion and consideration of this case with your fellow jurors. Don't ever hesitate to change some opinion you may have if you've become convinced that you're wrong. But you should never surrender any honest opinion that you have just to be congenial or to reach a verdict solely because of the opinions of the other jurors. Whatever your verdict is, ladies and gentlemen, it must be unanimous. That is, it must be agreed upon by all 12 of you. It must be in writing, as I've said, signed by one of you as four person, dated, returned in open court, and published or read out. This um, form of charge, ladies and gentlemen, I've prepared here um, for these instructions. Uh, they're intended to help you, of course, 
with this case, and if you need to refer to it, uh, I put headings in this um, charge to help you find any specific topic you may be looking at or looking for. You should consider these instructions in their entirety and as they relate to other portions of this charge um, when applying the law that I give you in these instructions to the facts as you find them to be from the evidence that's been submitted to you. I hope that nothing that I have done or said <laughs> or if I made a face or anything like that uh, leads you to believe that I have any opinion upon the facts of this case, the credibility of any witness upon the evidence or about the guilt or innocence of this defendant. That's not my role. I've told you my role is to make sure we have a fair trial and that you are properly instructed on the law that you're to apply. If I have, if you have observed, uh, observed something that I've done that makes you think I have an opinion about it, please disregard it because I don't. Uh, everybody's got their role in this trial and mine is not in regard to the guilt or innocence in this case. My only deal is for you as honest and conscientious and impartial jurors to consider this case as I have instructed you and that you return a verdict that speaks the truth as you find the truth to be in this case. Now, what we'll do at this time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, lunch hour's here, that took a little longer than I thought, but uh, I'll have the lunch brought up here and delivered to you, okay? Um, at this time, the first 12 uh, will retire into this jury room here. Uh, the other, the alternates, I'm gonna ask y'all to have a seat out there in the grand jury room. Um, since we have the first 12, uh, or we made one replacement. We, we have five alternates left. Y'all will not, as alternates, deliberate with the jury at this time. Uh, it happens all the time, though. Something may happen to one of the 12, and if we don't have alternates, uh, we have to start over. So uh, a few years ago, over here in Irwin County, I had a jury deliberating, and one of them spouse got in a wreck, and the other one got sick, so we had to have two alternates. So please be patient with us. You're, as an alternate, your presence is very important, but you will not deliberate with the first 12. All right, um, the following now, make sure you remember your number, and I know y'all just sort of set where you wanted to or in the trial of this case. The first 12, uh, Gerard 18, Gerard 48, excuse me, 56, 62, 64, 71, 75, 78, 79, 83, uh, 85, 86, and our first alternate, 94. Uh, Gerard, 71, was excused, okay? Uh, those 12, please step into the back. Uh, retired. Don't begin your deliberations, ladies and gentlemen, until you get this indictment, the charge, and the evidence that's been admitted. Thank you. Have a seat up there in the ground. Prior objections as to the content of the charge. Is there any objection to the 
delivery of the charge to the jury by the state. Not from the state, Judge. By the defense. No, Judge, we just renew our objection to Timely made, overruled, and preserved for the record. Thank you. Um, y'all got a job to do now with this evidence uh, to send out. Have y'all had an opportunity to look at it? We don't want to send out any summaries, right? No, uh, nothing no. violates the uh, continuing witness rule. Here are these uh, charges of Mr. Bukes. Of course, yeah. All right, let me ask you, um, Ms. Hart, Ms. Merchant, y'all have any objection to them deliberating while they're eating? No, no. Yeah, no. I wouldn't think so. No, no. Yeah. All right. Um, Is there anything that y'all, uh, of your exhibits, that you believe should not go out, or yeah, you think it? More. I, think they all right. I think all of those are pictures, Judge, so I would agree with that. And the well, conviction. now four is the uh, yeah and ah. federal court conviction. Mm -hmm. I would have to look at that, Judge. Um, normally, we have not sent um, convictions out or certified copies out. If it does go out, it cannot have certain portions of it in it. Alright. It's we, we don't it's not a big deal if it goes out or not to us. As long as none of the other mistakes go out. No, we agree it would be as to both both. Alright, we'll, uh, we'll just leave out both of those certified convictions. Can y'all think of anything off the top of your head in the state stack of evidence that should not go out other than the well, uh, I can think of not, not, nothing comes to mind immediately, Judge, but we would like a chance to just look at it once it's organized. Sure. Um, his statement would not go out, Judge, the one that he wrote. He wrote that during uh, right. what's law that, enforcement. What's, what's that exhibit? Um, number? I'm sorry. They took my exhibit uh, numbers away because they're trying to get some other stuff in order. Statement, letters, summaries. I think that's it. Uh, his statement, Judge. Defendant's statement. Judge, that's... Whatever it is, yeah. Oh, I think there was a summary prepared by law enforcement on the felons. I think the summary doesn't go out before the records go out. Right. Yeah, that no was, objection uh, to that. That was Brody's or uh, Baudry. Bill Baudry. Baudry's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Obviously, the CDs and would not go out. The written statement is number 181, Judge. Apologize, these weren't already in order. They were using some for, for closings. All right, Mr. Merchant, these are your exhibits one through six from our uh, pre trial hearing we had on Mr. Posey's. So, um, where's our clerk? Probably going to get lunch. Yeah. I'll just, if it's okay, I'll get them in order, and then I'll just tell the court what I think would not go out. That'd probably be quicker. Where does that start? 48. What about the bones and the teeth? Is there any hazard, biohazard for any of that? There's not. I didn't see y'all using gloves, did you? No, sir. They were, they've been cleaned. Plus, 
Plus, no DNA still exists on them, obviously, so nothing else does either. If y'all want to go ahead and deliver the lunch to the jurors, then that's fine. Thank you. Um, there's a there's a big gap right there. So the answer is yes, but it's a big gap right this second. Those film records have gotten separated, so hold on to those for a minute, please. Okay, I'm just a second. I said 81 and 82. Put them on top right here. Is, since we will be discussing evidence, is defend, are they waiving the defendant's presence, Judge? I, I take that as a yes. <laughs> Too many cooks in the kitchen, honestly. Like <laughs> no. Yeah, I'll stay with you. But I appreciate the offer. Thank you. you have to start with. I'm sorry? Okay, that sucks a lot.
I've got a uh, note from the jury um, that I'll share with you. Let me put this in the record. It says, can you please t clarify this question for the jury regarding number 22, venue, in jury instructions? Please define the term venue as proper and explain how it applies to court, excuse me, to count six, concealing death of another. If you'll exhibit that to the attorneys, please. I don't know if you have your copy of the charge there with you. Um, I don't know how to you know, draft it any better. Um, my suggestion uh, would be to respond to the jury on this piece of paper that um, as used in this charge, the term proper just means appropriate or correct or, you know, um, I want to help them. I, I don't know. If, I, I guess it's clear to me, but uh, I don't, it, it, please define the term venue is proper and explain how it applies to count six. I, I don't know how it, uh, applies to count, how to explain them. That's a matter of evidence, how it applies to count six, seems to me. But as far as what's italicized, venue is proper, please, please explain that term, venue is proper. So anyway, what's the state thing? Your Honor, is there a question specifically on point as to uh, that count? We would ask the court to just recharge the verdict on count six, count six being the Bring them back out and read the charge to them again? No, I think you can just write it back. But, um, so I think their question is the second paragraph looks like it only applies to the murder charge. And so, right. And so I think. Well, it if, does. Right. And so I think if you if you direct them to reread the first paragraph as to count six, does that make sense? Yes, it does to make sense. I'm just rereading it myself right now. I mean, I could just tell them the second paragraph of number 22 only applies to the murder charge, right? And I mean, that's what it says, as to the murder charges. Maybe I should put as to only the murder charge. Um, um, I think you could, you could instruct them that as to count six. Um, the second paragraph of 22 doesn't apply. Yes. That's a key Yes, Sean. We would ask, obviously, because I also don't want to confuse them, we would ask the court, even though they're only asking about six, that we direct that. I think I'm asking for the inverse. So I would ask the court to say that the second paragraph of 22 only applies to the murder charges. Well, I thought that's what I said, but I guess it's different then. Yeah. Uh, second paragraph of 22 only applies to the murder charges. That's, that's what we're asking for. Well, that's what we're talking about. That's the chief. Yes,
All right, fuel. Show that to me. Both sides, please. All right, that's it, y'all? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll be in recess here. Please turn that to me. Jerry, we'll be in recess till we hear from you.
All right, another question. Ms. Hart, you want to wait on Mr. Rigby, or? I'm sorry? No, I'm sorry. It's okay. okay. All right, second note here. Additionally, regarding count six, the location of the identified concealment of body determine the outcome of the verdict. Sounds like they didn't understand the response to the last question. But I don't know how to answer that one. What, you, you got any ideas and so on? I think it's just up to them to figure that. Does the here, if you'll let them, yes. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm trying to remember what I did with my indictment, Judge. <laughs> I just pulled it up if you want to. tell them the answer to this is the fact that if if the body was found in Ben Hill does venue have to be in Ben Hill? Right. I don't uh, think we can I don't know I, I'm inclined to say listen you've got the evidence and the charge and uh, but I'm anxious to hear some better suggestions. No, from I, I mean I think we need to give them some direction I'm just trying to think of what we can give them without it being a comment on the evidence. Um, Judge, it's the law. I mean, it has to be in Irwin County. Um, a, a portion of the concealing has to be in Irwin County, I agree, but where the body is located does not determine where that, I mean, concealment can be wrapping it in a quilt and putting it in a truck. Um, possibly, what about rereading the, that count of the indictment or telling them to look at the count of the indictment because it specifically says by removing body from 300 West Park Street, Irwin County. Right. Tell them you've got the indictments, you've got the evidence, and you've got the charge. And direct them to maybe reread the specific language. allegations of the indictment. Right. I, I, yes. I don't mind telling them that. Right. Just reread the specific uh -huh. allegations of the indictment. I think that's the best thing. The only, I mean, what we, without telling them, the only thing we can tell them is y'all are the fact finders, and whatever facts you find apply to the law of venue on count six. That's all we can tell them. I agree. I would ask that the court tell them that they have to determine that the charge as alleged in count six occurred in Irwin County. Yes, I agree. They have to find that the crime happened in Irwin County as alleged. Yes. So well, you could write. They do have to find that. You That's must, correct. <laughs> you must find in. No, Or, or venue must be proved in Irwin County. I don't know. No, I Sorry, I didn't talk about You have to find, well, I mean, what you're saying is you have to find the concealment happened in Irwin County in order to reach a guilty verdict on count six. Yes, that's what you're, exactly. That's what you're saying. Yes, Judge. I don't think we should tell them that. I'm not saying the concealment happened. I'm saying tell them that you have to find that the crime as alleged occurred in Irwin County. Right. In order to reach a correct alleged in the indictment, the crime as alleged in, in the count indictment. six, and again, that's fine. In order to find him, I, 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 it's up to the jury to decide what their findings are and how to apply the law to it to reach whatever verdict is appropriate. Um, but they have to find count six happened in Irwin County. To find a guilty verdict. Right. Anybody got a copy of the indictment? I do right here, Judge. 
signs out there in the jury. Thank you. identified concealment. What does that mean? Does the location of the identified concealment? I think that means that the ident where her body was found. I mean, I can't think of anything else. That, I think that, yes, I think that they are reading into that, the, burn that the concealment, the, the body itself being in Benio can constitute the concealment is what I think they're reading into that, yes. which obviously that's not how it's charged in the indictment. then is it the answer to this question just no? If that's what they mean. I think that the answer is no, but I don't think the court can tell them that without comment. Referring to the indictment. Yes. Yes, sir. I think telling them no would be commenting on the, would could possibly be commenting on the evidence. Right. I think you could just refer them to the indictment and refer them to the language the venue's charged. I mean, I'm, I'm reluctant to do anything much more than that. Okay. Um,
I want you to bring in the alternates yet, but just let them have I'd check and uh, see how much stamina we have left in the jury room, okay? They've been going a little while. Sit down if you want to. Listen, I'm just checking on you, ladies and gentlemen. Have y'all selected a full person? Five o'clock, it's a long day. How are y'all holding out? Do y'all want to keep going for a while? Do you want to call it a day? Come back in the morning, continue? Um, We'll start back at 9 in the morning. If you'll just return. deserve it you've earned it our alternates if y'all will be here say we'll start at nine y'all try to be here about 9 45 in the morning okay just to give you a little uh, break only for questions i mean that's the only reason not to um cars here in the morning in case you can y'all seem pretty happy i'll see y'all at nine o'clock too then that's great well, uh, the jury leaves the courthouse 